Good morning, and welcome to the Case Western School of Law. My name is Juliet Kostritsky, and I'm the director of the Center for Business Law here. So the Center for Business Law, Case Western, is hosting the George A. Leet Business Law Full Day Symposium entitled Corporate Law and Private Ordering. What are the limits? I owe great thanks to my colleagues, Professors Anat Alon Beck, Charles Gorsmo, and Robert Rapp. At every turn, they offered to help with the LEAD Symposium. Without them, it never would have happened. So the LEAD Symposium takes place every two years. Two years ago, the LEAD addressed the anti-competitive effects, fiduciary duties, and ESG issues posed by the equity holdings of the three big index funds. The law review uh, at Case Western published many of the papers in a highly read symposium issue. Today, we are excited and pleased to welcome our speakers, all of whom are important corporate law or contract scholars or both. The LEAD Symposium will focus on the intersections of contract law and corporations. Increasingly, corporations following the idea of a firm as a nexus of contracts have relied on a contractual paradigm to craft contracts to engage in private ordering as a means of customizing corporate governance. Some of these contractual provisions are permitted by statute. In other cases, these private contracts may diverge from corporate governance rules that might otherwise govern. Therefore, these agreements may create conflicts with corporate law structures, raising issues as to what deviations should be permitted. Our speakers will address how much freedom parties should have to enter contracts which affect or impair corporate law provisions or protections. So next, I'm going to give you a thumbnail guide to our speakers, and then I will introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Jill Fish. So our keynote speaker, Professor Jill Fish, will address limits on contractual freedom in corporate law and examine whether those limits vary with the type of corporate form. Anat Alon Beck will address contractual provisions under which employees who are not yet stockholders contractually give up their rights to stockholder inspection. Professors Mitu Julati, Bob Scott, and Stephen Choi address how M&A lawyers both innovate with new clauses and import non-beneficial encrusted clauses into their contracts and how agency costs, costs affect those drafting decisions. Jonathan Lipson suggests that proponents of corporate social responsibility should look to contract law rather than to corporate governance to achieve their goals. Gabrielle Rattleberg will address property, contract, and process in organizational instruments as a way of understanding how organizational instruments differ based on whether they are consented to or not. Robert Thompson examines the phenomenon of contracting out in closely held entities, VC-backed startups and publicly held corporations, and the remaining limits on contracting out. Juliet Kostritsky is presenting for her co-authors, Jillian Fox and Blake Spiller. She will address how the ambiguity of environmental social governance term terms mandating the pursuit of ESG would be analyzed under contract law and corporate law. And now, with great pleasure, I turn to our keynote speaker. It is a real honor to welcome Professor Jill Fish to be our keynote speaker. She is the Saul A. Fox Distinguished Professor of Business Law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School and a professor of finance at the Wharton School. She is also a director of the European Corporate Governance Institute, which publishes many wonderful papers. She is a graduate of Yale Law School, where she was senior editor at the Yale Law and Policy Review. She has been a visiting professor at Harvard, Berkeley, Georgetown, and Columbia. It is hard to over overstate what a pivotal role professor, professor Fish plays in addressing the most important issues facing firms today many of which involve the intersection between contract and corporate law. She has written on shareholder agreements and private ordering, contracting out of shareholder appraisal, governance by contract, the implications for corporate bylaws, and shareholder collaboration. Her scholarship illuminates the key intersections between contract 
and corporate law, the very focus of this conference. She has also written on securities issues. Her most recent article, co-authored with Quinn Curtis and Adriana Robertson, is entitled, Do Mutual Funds Deliver on Their Promises?, which is forthcoming in the Michigan Law Review. Her expertise also extends to financial literacy and retail investors. We are thrilled to have Professor Jill Fish here, and I don't want to take any of her time away. When I asked her to participate, she readily agreed, so long as it was an in-person event. So here we are, and we could not be more fortunate that she has joined us for the LEED Symposium. Juliet, thank you for that warm welcome. And yes, I, uh, I'm speaking to the occasion of your national screen, so <laughs> a special thanks to those of you who may be able to come today. I really appreciate it, and I know that the later speakers here today certainly appreciate it as well. Um, so yes, uh, when you read through that work, Juliet, it sounds like I've written a lot or thought a lot about corporations and private ordering. And I have to say, I haven't figured very much of it out. Um, so this is going to be sort of more musings than answers, and I welcome your uh, questions and reactions. So um, the sort of idea of a corporation as a contract has been around for a long time. And I don't know if you can see, yeah, I guess I have the date on there. So around the time, I hate to admit this, around the time I started teaching, <laughs> there was this Columbia Law Review Symposium on contract theory of the corporation versus the old concession theory. Um, and at that time, it was a pretty lively debate. There were a lot of people who said the corporation is not a contract. Uh, there are a bunch of mandatory rules. There should be a bunch of mandatory rules because the corporation takes its authority from state law and states create corporations with particular objectives in mind and with particular structures that hold the corporation accountable, both, to, both internally to its, its constituents, but more broadly to the state and to society. And I think one of the things that we worry about today is the breakdown of those accountability mechanisms. Now, I won't pin the fault um, for, those, for that breakdown on the contract theory, but it's something, something to kind of keep in mind. In any event, I highly recommend the 1989 symposium to you. Um, some great scholars wrote in it. I did not, because I was only starting in teaching. Um, but, you know, despite that lively debate and despite really good arguments on both sides, what we've seen since that time uh, throughout my career is a growing domination of the contractual theory, right? The contract, contractarians have more or less won out, right? So, yeah, go ahead. All right. So we see this particularly in Delaware. Delaware, of course, um, is the center of U.S. corporate law. Um, we see this in the Delaware courts, an increasingly expansive view of the corporation as contract and a recognition of the broad freedom of corporate participants to rearrange, uh, to modify, to deviate from statutory constraints, not just in situations in which the statute exp expressly says you can do something differently, but even where the statute is silent, or in some cases even where the statute appears to create an affirmative obligation, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Right? But this broad language in the courts. Right? Now this is consistent with what's been going on in the Delaware legislature. Right? The Delaware statute, the corporate law statute, has generally been described as an enabling statute, meaning it allows a lot of private ordering. But if you look at the last 20, 30 years of amendments to the Delaware statute, we see even more amendments that authorize private ordering. And it almost seems like every time a practitioner thinks of something that they might like to do in a charter or bylaw provision, the Delaware legislature says, OK, just in case there's any doubt, here's statutory language. You can do this. 
right? Now you're all cleverly thinking, oh, but what about fee shifting bylaws, right? And that's my exception that proves the rule, right? But you know, by and large, right, lots and lots of provisions, um, you know, allowing contracting out of everything from uh, director's fiduciary duties in the case of 102b7 to uh, violations of the corporate opportunity doctrine in 122.17, and you're going to say, well, it's not really contracting out of fiduciary duties. Wait, right? I'll, 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 I'll hone in on that point a little bit more later. Um, but okay, right? So why have the contractarians won? Right? What's the story? Well, there are a lot of defenses of the contract analogy, both from a sort of legalistic perspective and from an efficiency perspective. And I'm not going to go through all of them here. You've got great scholars in the room who have written on a lot of these topics. But from a pure contract approach, and let me just be clear, I don't want to commit malpractice. I'm not a contract scholar. I've never taught contracts. Um, I didn't learn very much about contracts in law school. Uh, you, you will remember, and I'm not going to repeat it, but Juliet told you where I went to law school, so it's no surprise that I didn't learn a whole lot about contracts there. But in any event, <laughs> I know this is being recorded. <laughs> um, in any event, right? It, you know, there's a lot to like about corporations from a contract perspective. Right, the idea that well, you've got these documents, the charter and bylaws, that look like they're allocating rights and responsibilities among corporate participants, much in the same way that a contract does. There are tools for modifying those rights. Um, shareholders, when they buy into a corporation, it's a voluntary choice. Nobody has stock thrust upon them. Right? Shareholders are not becoming participants in corporations under duress, even the employees that are not worries about. It's not quite duress. It might be close, but it's not there. Right? Um, and you have all sorts of controls with respect to if the board or the shareholders sort of gets too rowdy, runs amok, does, uh, takes advantage of their ability to modify the contract terms or needs to input new terms into the contract. Uh, both the board and the shareholders under Delaware law have the power to amend the bylaws, right? Uh, charter has to give directors that power, but the charter invariably does. Um, uh, you have director elections, you have outside control contests that discipline the use of these contractual tools. So it looks like it is flexible. It looks like it governs uh, the things that contracts would govern, participants to the contract. It looks like it's voluntary. It looks like there's at least implied consent. Um, again, you know, from my outsider's perspective with respect to contract law, I buy the argument that people like Strine make that this is like a contract. Right? Um, there's also a lot to defend in terms of the uh, uh, objectives of a contractual approach, right? So this idea of private ordering, right? Number one, all firms aren't alike. If we were going to have a statute that set up corporate structure and had a uniform set of requirements for all corporations, well, that statute wouldn't get it right for every single corporation. Every single corporation. There are corporations in which shareholders need more power. There are shareholders in which uh, directors or the CEO needs more freedom, more uh, flexibility to operate however he or she sees fit. Right? Think Elon Musk. He needs a tremendous amount of flexibility and absolutely no corporate constraints at all. Right? Um, so you know you need that kind of flexibility. You've got different ownership structures, right? So a corporation with a controlling shareholder might need different checks and balances than a corporation that is held primarily by institutional investors, or a corporation that's held by dispersed retail investors, or a corporation like many Midwestern corporations that's very much held by employees, former employees, and investors in the local community. Right? Those corporations vary. Their needs vary. A startup company that might not be profitable it might have a long on-ramp before its innovation is going to be fully developed. Might need a different corporate structure than a mature company that basically, you know, if anything, it needs a little sort of prompting so that it doesn't just keep running in place, 
right? So that those differences among corporations call for variation in the structure, and private ordering allows that kind of firm-specific tailoring. In addition, even if we said, well, you know, we're worried about whether you know investors will be taken advantage of, and private ordering is going to be uh, controlled, usurped by management. We are concerned about whether regulation is superior to market forces in terms of getting it right. right? It's hard to know exactly what the right corporate structure is. I think about the empirical literature on corporate governance, right? And you know, I've been living with and reading this empirical literature for years and years. And there's tons of people, increasingly now in law schools, but originally in finance departments, that were studying things like anti-takeover defenses, uh, staggered boards, poison pills, uh, independent directors, uh, performance-based compensation, you name it. And what's the common theme among all those empirical studies? Uh, the evidence is kind of mixed. <laughs> we don't really know. We can't point to the literature and say definitively, yeah, that's the good corporate governance. That's the right answer. I remember one, uh, uh, at one conference several years ago going to the head of corporate governance at one of the big three institutional investors. And Juliet, I'm going to amend big three because I always want to add fidelity. I always feel like fidelity gets left out of the equation. So I'm going to call them the big four. Right? But I went to one of the uh, uh, big three or big four um, uh, corporate governance and I said, heads, and I said, you've got these voting policies that require you or, you know, that where you decide you're going to vote pro or against all of these corporate governance mechanisms. And the literature's pretty mixed, right? Why are you so sure that, say, a staggered board is bad at every company, right? I can think of examples where having a staggered board kind of worked out, right? And I teach my students the air, gas, air products case is the example of that, right? Where maybe it wasn't such a bad thing for air, gas to have a staggered board. Right? So I said, why are you doing this across the board as opposed to have, having you know, a very specific policy? And he couldn't give me a very good answer. His answer is, well, you know, on, on the whole, right, on average, more times than not, it seems like getting rid of the staggered board would be a good thing. Right? Well, you know, I'm not super happy with that voting policy, but I think it would be worse if we, say, banned staggered boards as a matter of government regulation just because more often than not, staggered boards reduce value. Right? And you see the same debate more recently with respect to dual class stock. Right? Is dual class stock good or bad? I don't know. There's a lot of literature on both sides of the question. Maybe it varies. Maybe for some firms it's good and for some firms it's bad. And of course, there you are back to private ordering, right? Let's let the firms sort it out. Let's let the market sort it out. And even if for an individual firm it's a bad choice and the firm gets it wrong, seems to me that's better than having the whole, you know, <laughs> all of corporate law suffer the wrong answer. So, you know, that's part, you know, and there's a whole lot of literature in this. I'm not going to go into detail on the defense of private ordering, but those are some of the reasons why, from an efficiency approach, we might think a, uh, 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 that kind of flexibility through uh, con contractarianism makes sense. Um, so, as I said, we have the tools inherent in the way the corporation is set up. A corporation is regulated by statute. But a corporation individualizes its structure, its balance of power, its accountability through its charter, right? And statutes say the charter has to have this minimum. The uh, uh, senior professor from whom I took over teaching corporations when I first started uh, teaching uh, had students draft a charter. That was one of the exercises they, they had to do every year. It's not hard, right? takes about a page. There's you know, five or six things you have to put in there. right? This is not terribly complicated. right? But if you go online, if you look at the charters of publicly held companies, you see they're longer. There's lots of variation. There are optional provisions. right? That's a place where private ordering occurs. Same thing with respect to the bylaws. Right? And I was talking a few minutes ago about the bylaws. Uh, corporations use bylaws even more. And in part, they use bylaws more because it's easier to amend them. Right? And because either the board or the shareholders acting unilaterally can put new provisions, can respond to problems, put these things into place. Finally, uh, and in particular in privately held companies, 
corporations are increasingly making use of shareholder agreements. Now, Gabe isn't here. I don't know if Gabe is even listening, but Gabe is, of course, number one, uh, pioneered a lot of the research into shareholder agreements and um, uh, shown that shareholder agreements are not limited to private companies. There are a number of public companies, a surprising number, that are using shareholder agreements. Anat has focused on shareholder agreements in the distinctive context of employee shareholders, right? Um, shareholder agreements are a growing tool and they present some distinctive concerns and I'll talk about them, right? But those are the tools that we have, the contract type tools, right? So the title of my talk is Limits, right? And you might be asking yourself, well, are there limits? And if there are, where do they come from? Why should there be limits, right? Those are the questions that I'm kind of struggling with. So uh, that's the late uh, Bill Allen, Chancellor Allen, who said, um, you know, in the midst of this debate over concession versus contractarianism, corporate law isn't bereft of mandatory terms. Right? Um, what are those mandatory terms? How do we know? Right? Where do they come from? And the Delaware courts recently have been struggling to answer that question, right? So. Here are some possibilities. Let me just lay out, let me sketch out a couple of possible limits of contracting. And let me give you a couple of examples then to stew on. Right? And we can sort of see how these various limits might or might not work. Right? So one limit is statutory limits, right? If the statute says you can't modify this by contract, presumably you can't. And there are a couple of examples, even in the flexible enabling Delaware statute, where the statute does that, right? So the statute says, you can't adopt a fee shifting charter or bylaw provision. Absolutely clear. The statute says, you can't exculpate directors for violating the duty of loyalty. Absolutely clear, right? So, great, we're done, right? That's the source of limits. When it says in the statute, you can't modify, you can't modify. Problem is, there are relatively few of those limits. Um, I think any person who believes in the, con in the contractarian model might at least be suspicious that those are the only limits. Right? So what about, right, and oh, that's, that's an example of the 102B7 language, right? Because you don't all have your statutory supplements open in front of you. <laughs> I, I did this for my students too, right? So, you know, the, uh, such a provision shall not eliminate or limit the uh, liability of directors is pretty clear statutory language. All right, but what about when the statute doesn't say you can't do something, but the statute says you shall do something? Does that mean you can't contract around that? For example, the Delaware statute says a corporation shall have an annual meeting. Does that mean you can't have an, you, you can't uh, have a uh, charter provision, say, that says we're getting rid of the annual meeting. Well, just recently, the Delaware Supreme Court decided the Manti case. The Manti case deals with appraisal rights. The Delaware statute says shareholders shall have appraisal rights. And the Manti court, the Delaware Supreme Court, said, yeah, it says shall, but shall doesn't really mean shall. Maybe shall means may. Uh, but it turned out that that language wasn't a hard limit. So if we're looking to statutory language, we might not ultimately be super satisfied, right? Here's another example. The board of directors um, uh, in a merger shall adopt a resolution approving an agreement of merger. Well, what if I uh, set up my corporation and I put in a charter? In this corporation, uh, the decision to merge will be based on a supermajority vote by the shareholders. We don't need board approval. Right? Shareholder vote alone can approve a merger. Is that okay? Private ordering, right? Maybe I'm worried about the board of directors. Maybe this is a corporation in which shareholders need more power. Maybe I'm worried about conflicts of interest in mergers, right? There's always that risk, right? Think about, oh, um, what's your recent conflict of interest in a merger? Uh, maybe uh, I'm, uh, you know, a Twitter shareholder, say, hypothetically. And I'm thinking to myself, well, what if somebody wants to come and take over my company and um, 
you know, I think they're bad for the company or I think they're bad for society. And I'm worried that the board of directors is either going to have a conflict or they're going to feel that they're constrained by their Revlon duties. So I want to take this decision away from the board. I want to give it to the shareholders. And the shareholders can balance their pocketbook interests versus, versus societal interests. Right? I think that's better. So I can come up with a nice story about why this might make sense from a governance perspective, but is it legal under the Delaware statute? I think the af answer after Manti is we just don't know, right? Okay, so, well, what about public policy? Right? People identify a handful of what they think are clearly mandatory provisions of Delaware law, and they say, yeah, it's not exactly in the statute, but there are public policy limits. And in particular, they flag fiduciary duties. Well, I've got a concern about whether we really have a public policy limit against contracting around fiduciary duties. Number one, example number one, 102B7, which does allow some contractual freedom. Example number two, section 12217, which allows some contractual freedom. But more broadly, why are we so worried about fiduciary duties? Think about the analogy to limited partnerships and LLCs, in which we say complete freedom of contract. You are free to eliminate fiduciary duties entirely in your governing documents. Well, what is it that distinguishes the corporation from the LLC or the limited partnership? In many cases, it's not ownership structure. We've got publicly traded LLCs and limited partnerships. Um, we've got LLCs and limited partnerships in which the investors are not particularly sophisticated. Uh, if we are worried about, say, market efficiency, there are Delaware cases that say, gee, in the LLC, we're confident that the market can price these fiduciary duty waivers adequately. So why should the corporation be different, right? And I haven't heard a particularly compelling public policy argument, at least that allows me to sort between those two cases. So I'm putting public policy on the table, but I'm not sure exactly what we mean by public policy, right? So third possibility, structural integrity of the corporate form. What do I mean by that? I don't know what I mean by that. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, maybe there's just something about the way we have set up the corporation that requires certain features to be present. Think about, well, what are the key attributes of the corporation? Limited liability, separation of ownership and control, centralized management with authority delegated both from shareholders and the state. Right? Those are at least some of the things that are floating around in my head when I think about structural integrity. And it could be that some contractual modifications interfere with that structural integrity. Just think about it. Right? Finally, internal versus external affairs. Right? This idea that, well, yeah, freedom of contract is great, but you can't contract away the rights of third parties. Right? Now, I think that is a hard limit. Right? So for example, again, going back to 102B7, the corporation can't contract away director liability for an illegal payment of dividends. Why not? Because the dividend restrictions protect not just shareholders, but creditors. And creditors' rights, arguably, are external to the firm. Right? Similarly, when Strine talks in Boilermakers about forum selection bylaws, he says, well, you can't use a forum selection bylaw to govern a tort claim, right? Somebody comes in, even if that tort claimant happens also to be a shareholder, right? The claims have to be about the internal affairs of the corporation. There's scope language in sections 102 and 109 that also suggests limits to internal affairs of the corporation. Only problem with that, after the Shabba Cookie decision, I'm not entirely sure what the internal affairs of the corporation are, right? There's these intra-corporate affairs, right? Which, you know, all credit to Bill Chandler for making up that concept and getting the Delaware Supreme Court to buy it, right? But I don't exactly know what internal affairs are anymore. I know that Delaware and California don't think they mean exactly the same thing, right? So, you know, that is a limiting principle I fully concede, but how far that limit extends is a little hard to figure out, right? And here's that limiting language in um, 
the charter provision, right? The, uh, ch ch a charter can include any provision for the management of the business and the conduct of, of the affairs of the corporation, right? That's how far, right? So these contract tools, in theory, can't go any farther than the statutory authorization. Great, right? So, right? before I get to my examples, I think we'll have more fun with all of these dry principles once I give you a couple of examples. But before I get there, let me just flag one more question, and this goes directly to Anant and Gates' work. Do the limits vary depending on which tool you're using to engage in this contracting, right? So there are some people that argue Gabe, I think, had this language in an early draft of his uh, first paper on shareholder agreements, and I think he took the language out. But some people say you've got greater contractual freedom when it's a shareholder agreement instead of a charter or bylaw provision. And I say some people, it's not just Gabe, right? We see that language in oral argument before the Supreme Court in Shabakuki. Basically, anything is okay if it's in a shareholder agreement. We see that language in a number of the cases. Right? Now, the rationale for that is that shareholder agreements look more like contracts than these other things, the charter and bylaws. I'm not sure that's really true, but I also think that there are sort of heightened problems with doing corporate governance through a shareholder agreement. Right? I'm not saying shareholder agreements are bad, there are lots of things you think about consideration, right? You think about sort of the individualized issues with buying stock. They belong in a shareholder agreement. But corporate governance, who controls the corporation, what um, accountability mechanisms shareholders have, should that be something you can contract around in what the courts have characterized as a private document? Right? And think back to what I said about accountability and the sort of key structure of the corporation, do we take that away if we allow complete freedom of contract in these documents? So I've written about it and I worry about shareholder agreements and I probably will continue to, right? And finally, is it really the case that shareholder agreements are qualitatively different from a charter or bylaw provision? So, um, in the uh, 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 Dropbox case in Chaba Cookie, we were dealing with an initial provision in a charter at the time the company went public, right? All of the <coughs> shareholders who bought into the cor corporation, seems like that was pretty clear consent. Not consent that the directors would put some provision into place afterwards, but consent to a provision at the time they bought the stock doesn't seem like such a problem from a traditional contract perspective either, although again, I will concede I'm no contracts expert. There are contracts experts in the room, talk to them. All right, so let's consider some examples and I'll give you three, okay? So first question, can a corporation go public with a charter provision? So again, like Shaba Cookie, initial charter provision at the time the company goes public saying, we're not gonna hold annual meetings and our directors are going to be chosen by our existing directors. No shareholder elections, none of this messy stuff, right? We don't want to deal with proxy contests and all of that. The board will replace from within. Is that a permissible uh, contractual structure? Two, are there limits on the contractability of traditional shareholder rights? And by traditional shareholder rights, I'm thinking about things like inspection rights, which are not uh, and I both care a lot about, and appraisal rights and, and the like, dividend rights, so forth. Three, can a corporation contractually limit director and officer fiduciary duties? I warned you I was going to get back to that question. All right, so let's think about these. Contracting out of the annual meeting. So, first of all, annual meeting, election of directors. This is clearly the affairs of the corporation. This clearly is the directors, the officers, the shareholders, right? So it's not external. We've got no internal affairs problem here, right? So from a scope perspective, this is clearly permissible, right? Yes, the statute 211 in Delaware says an annual meeting of shareholders shall be had for the direction of directors. But Manzi told us shall isn't determinative, right? That language in the statute we can take that into account, but we're not bound by that. The statute says shall in a bunch of places. We need to do something more, right? So what is the something more? How do we go about analyzing that? 
Is this, or is the election of directors an essential, a fundamental attribute of the corporate form? So I talked earlier about centralized management. I talked about board accountability. Do we lose that in some sort of um, irreparable way if we remove shareholder elections, right? How does Blasius play into this? Blasius says shareholder voting, the shareholder holder fr franchise, that's an essential component of the corporation. Right? So if you take Blasius seriously, and I will concede nobody does, right? but if you take Blasius seriously, this should give you some pause. Whether Blasius is based on structure or public policy or a little bit of both, this is a big change. Right? And you also think about, well, from a market perspective, is this something that the market can price? Or would it be able to price this if we had corporations that adopted this kind of a change? And notice how wonderfully this structure would prevent a corporation from proxy contests and shareholder activism, right? This is the uh, staggered board and the poison pill on steroids. But if Marty Lipton came along <laughs> and offered this to your corporation, would you take the risk? <laughs> So, so those are some of the thoughts that we might have. Now, if you're saying, Fish, this is an extreme case, this is a crazy case, nobody would even think about this as a possibility, let me ask you, could advance notice bylaws, which are all over the place and which are getting increasingly aggressive, could advance notice bylaws transcend these same limits? In other words, the frame that I've given you, let's apply it to something that everybody doesn't think is too extreme and off the wall. Okay. You come up with the same answer. What's the limiting principle? What's the distinction? Because I got to tell you, I can get to very close to the same place with a, what is the word, horse choker of an advance notice bylaw? And I can do it. <laughs> and there are corporations that have. Okay, so I told you I wasn't going to give you any answers. I'm not. This is like a this is like a corporations class. I'm going to give you the questions. The answers will be on the exam. <laughs> Students, are you listening? <laughs> All right. So contractability of traditional shareholder rights. Right. So we're increasingly seeing this, right? And if you look at, in particular, um, private equity uh, uh, funded firms and venture capital funded firms, you get a host of shareholder agreements. They deal with all of these kinds of questions, right? And a contractual approach may well be efficient, right? I think there's a lot of room for these big private companies to say, you know, there's something wrong with traditional corporate structure. There's something unduly burdensome, either with these rights or the way they're being exercised. And we should have greater freedom of contract. What I don't think is that the workaround should happen through shareholder agreements. And right, in particular, I think the analogy to private contract is misplaced. Because I think that with respect to these kinds of rights, we're not really talking about an individual right. Why do shareholders inspect, have inspection rights? It's not just to protect that shareholder's personal interest in understanding the company and valuing his or her shares. It's to promote accountability. It's a check on that delegated authority. And that check operates for the benefit of all shareholders. And allowing some shareholders to contract it away, right, it detracts from whatever we think of as the value of accountability in promoting a more efficient corporation. And I'm particularly worried because the uh, language in the cases suggests these things are more enforceable <coughs> if the investors are sophisticated. Well, it's the sophisticated investors that I want to have these rights so when push comes to shove, they can exercise the rights and they can get something done. It doesn't help me that the little guy who's got 100 shares and doesn't have a lawyer, yeah, he or she has inspection rights, but the big investor, right, they contracted them away and that's going to be binding, right? So if you view these as collective rights, then a private agreement, a shareholder agreement is problematic, but some flexibility of contract, maybe in a charter provision, maybe in a bylaw provision, might depend on the particular issue. I think there's room for that. And I think the, the way 
private ordering should, should go is exactly what we've seen in areas like forum selection and proxy access and reimbursement of proxy expenses, right? The issue comes up and the Delaware legislature says explicitly, yes, you can do this. So the legislature makes the policy judgment. And if you can do it, here's how, right? So you can do certain things in a charter. You can do certain things in a bylaw. You can do certain things in a shareholder adopted bylaw, right? There are different mechanisms that go to the public policy considerations. And this idea that shareholder rights are collective rather than individual, here I'm channeling, scary to say this, but I'm channeling Ed Rock rather than Hartens and Goddess, right? Ed Rock says, you know, directors manage a corporation in the interests of the corporation. Hart and Singala say, well, we look through it. What we really care about is what the individual shareholders want, right? That individualistic view of shareholders and shareholders' rights, that's exactly what I'm rejecting here. Okay. And of course, this promotes some of the objectives that I have talked about and have talked about in my research, right? Transparency, equal treatment, and in particular, with respect to governance rights in which we're worried about um, opportunism, a, um, uh, a joint process for negotiating over those governance rights, the board and the shareholders, as opposed to a unilateral approach. Okay, final example, uh, which I think is good. I'm doing okay, time wise, wise, right? Yeah. Okay, so final example, fiduciary duties. Right? And I like to talk about fiduciary duties and freedom of contract because, I, as I said, fiduciary duties are always sort of the poster child. Right? How much freedom of contract uh, do, investor, do shareholders or corporations have? How much should they have? So think about fiduciary duties in a couple of different situations. Oh, no, there's subparts. Right? We get to the final exam question and there's subparts. Right? But um, so Delaware just amended it's an exculpation provision, right? The original exculpation provision until this year said you could only exculpate directors. You couldn't exculpate officers, right? And in fact, in Gantler, the court said, well, that means you can only exculpate officers. You can only exculpate directors. But that's not what the statute said. The statute said you can have a charter provision that exculpates directors. It didn't say directors and not officers. Right? Not officers wasn't listed in those exceptions, like the duty of loyalty. In fact, there were, I think, six or seven states before Delaware made its change in which the exculpation statutes explicitly say you can exculpate directors and officers. The ALI principles had a um, sort of freedom of contract approach to exculpation even in the absence of statute, statutory authority. And the ALI provision said, you can put in a contract provision exculpating officers or directors. So what if some enterprising corporation says, and there's a lot of debate about should you be able to exculpate officers as a matter of policy? This is back to dual class and staggered boards. This is one of those things with perhaps no clear right answer. So what if a corporation decides, okay, we're going to put in a charter provision that allows us to exculpate both? Is that allowed under the Delaware statute? Or is that prohibited under the Delaware statute? How do we know? Um, if that case doesn't worry you, well, here's another example. Revlon duties. Right? Revlon duties aren't in the Delaware statute at all. This is something the courts have made up. It's a common law duty. It's not. The same in every other state. There are lots of states. I think Ohio is one. Doesn't Ohio not, you don't have rebel duties in Ohio, right? No. Right. So, you know, so again, right, from a public policy perspective, right, if states can vary in their treatment of this, seems like it's not a compelling, right? You don't have to have rebel duties, do you? No one incorporates you. <laughs> that's not true. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a data, data point, right? <laughs> like a data point that we don't really know what to do with me, ignore it. <laughs> um, but you know, should you, should corporations be able to contract around Revlon duties in Delaware? Would the Delaware courts allow such a thing? And if they wouldn't, what's the reason for not? Um, third, and perhaps the most interesting issue, 
shareholder primacy, right? So in the current restatement of corporate governance, draft restatement, early stage draft, right? There are two formulations of the objectives of the corporation. One is the Delaware states in which the restatement says directors have to manage in the best interests of shareholders. And the other is constituency states in which directors are allowed to manage in accordance with stakeholder governance. So what if a Delaware corporation puts in its charter, hey, we want to allow our directors to follow stakeholder governance. In other words, can you contract around shareholder privacy in your charter? And again, I'll make it easy for you contract types. Let's put it in the initial charter, right, at the time the company goes public, so everybody has advanced warning and nobody feels like their rights have been yanked away from them, right? Midstream adoptions raised, I will grant you their own questions, right? But can a corporation do this? And in particular, can a corporation do this without converting to a public benefit corporation, right? Is shareholder primacy an optional feature of corporate governance that you can contract around? Right? Now, I don't know the answer to any of these questions, but let me suggest that these questions make us think hard about exactly how much freedom of contract we're willing to tolerate. And to the extent we don't think that freedom is absolute, what principles should we use what principles should the Delaware courts use? What principles should the council and the Delaware legislature use in determining the limits of contract? So that's my talk. <laughs> Those are my questions. Um, the answers will be on your exams. <laughs> um, but I, I welcome your uh, thoughts. Am I just go for it. <laughs> um, I actually, there's so many, but I wanted to start with the uh, with the previous slide on the what's your take on the public benefit corporation? Do you think that they should convert, not convert? I know you said it's a question, but I oh. Thank you so much. First of all, this was amazing. I'm like, I want you to discuss all of these things. Can we continue for a few more hours? Okay, we'll lock you up here. Um, and um, so I, I have three. One is with regards to the public benefit corporations, right? Because as you know, we have this debate. Some say we don't even need it. We can do this now. We don't need this thing. And Delaware is, you know, changing and changing and changing, trying to make this public benefit corporation easier, easier to convert. I don't see that many conversions. Well, and some. some. Um, and, and so I'm wondering on that, that's one. And the second, um, you know, there's currently in front of Delaware this issue of what to do with the gap that we have in the literature, right, with regards to private ordering. And as you know, they've been leaning towards, as you showed in the beginning, allowing and allowing and allowing private ordering. And so with what we know, and I'm still trying to figure out with the mandatory provisions, right, where did they come from? Do you think it's going to change the, the way we think about the corporation? Are we not going to look at the corporation as you know, as a you know, from the contract theory anymore? If if they won't allow that one, and I don't know what they'll do. I know it's in front of the, the court right now. I've been trying to push them to tell us, as as, as you know, in Jewel. And by the way, Professor Fish is the first one to cover this. That's in your shareholder agreements. That's why I wrote my paper afterwards. Um, you see footnotes supporting it, and you see footnotes against it. So I'm thinking, so which one is it? Well, if I were on the Delaware court, I could give you a more conclusive answer. <laughs> but then I might not be in the majority, so who knows? No, um, so let me, let me take the easier question first. What about PBCs? Yeah. And I think that PBCs are an easy way of dodging the question about what contractual limits there should be, right? Because you would say, well, okay, we don't just decide whether you can contract around shareholder privacy, just go and form a PBC instead. But that's kind of the same as saying, well, we don't have to decide about freedom of contract in the corporation because you can go form an LLC, right? That doesn't really tell you anything. And I think actually, the question should be asked in the opposite way. 
right? What are the essential features that make a corporation different, right? What do you get? What do you know you're getting when you buy stock in a corporation as opposed to shares in an LLC? And there, um, fiduciary duties are hard, right? Because I think there is an argument, well, even if you can contract around fiduciary duties in a, um, an LLC, maybe you shouldn't have as much freedom in the corporation, but does that mean no contracting around fiduciary duties is permissible? And I think what the legislature has told us is no, the answer to that is not true, right? Some contractual freedom, even in the corporation, is okay, and you see it in the statute. And my inclination is to think that the legislature is going to allow a lot more freedom, right? And I think that's why we see that amendment to the exculpation provision. I think if push came to shove, the Delaware legislature probably wouldn't be averse to greater contractual freedom on shareholder primacy. Right? Now, that's not the same as saying we're waiving fiduciary duties altogether. I don't think the legislature would go that far. But I think fiduciary duties are a little bit different from corporate structure. Right? I think the balance of power between officers, directors, and shareholders is actually a key feature of the corporate form. And what partnerships and LLCs give you is more flexibility and therefore more unknowability about what that structure looks like, who really has the power. And I think for the corporate form, that's problematic. I think if you think about, well, what do I get off the shelf from the corporation, right? I know what the rules are. I know who calls the shots. And if directors choose directors and shareholders make operational decisions and things like that, it's not really a corporation. And I think that has implications not just for investors, but also for third parties and also for the state. And so that's how I've moved from your first question to your second question. Can you share with us a little bit, you're on the ALI committee, right? Restating corporate governance. And there's a lot, you know, going on with that. So what's going to be, what's the... What, I have no idea what's going to be. <laughs> but we're at the early stages, obviously, of the process. Yeah, I, mean, I have a million questions I could ask you. I mean, just following up kind of on what Anand was saying, uh, asking about, you know, I hear the phrase off the rack or off the shelf for, uh, I mean, is there some benefit? I mean, what is the value of, instead of having a single corporate form that you can within it do anything you want, having separate ones where you know these are the features you can change. Uh, if you're an LLC, you can waive duty of loyalty to an extent you can't in a corporation. Uh, if you're a PBC, you can uh, favor other stakeholders over uh, uh, over stockholders, uh, and you can't in the uh, in the C corp. Is there is I mean, is there any benefit to keeping those conceptually distinct? In I, love, I love that question because that question makes me uh, state explicitly something that probably should have been in my slides and wasn't. And that is, I think there's a huge efficiency to simplifying the extent to which private ordering can occur. Right? I think there's a real cost to analyzing complex, firm-specific contract terms. Right? I start off the semester teaching my students some LLC and limited partnership stuff. And those contracts are so complicated, and they're so dense. And I think about, number one, public markets. And sure, we've got institutional investors, but today most institutional investors are index funds and they're not doing the complex work of analyzing these things. And I'm not sure whether the market really is, right? But I think it's a problem if you've got that degree of complexity. And I think the corporate form is designed in part to say, okay, on a bunch of basic features, you're gonna know what you're getting, right? At the end of the day, you might have two classes of stock, or 10 classes of stock, or one class of stock, right? There is some variation, but infinite variation, I think is problematic, even from a market or capital investor perspective. And I don't think that simplicity is limited to the public corporation, right? I mean, one of the things that we see right now in big private company corporations is a lot of complexity. It's one of the reasons I think that public cor that private corporations today choose to go public. But even those complexities in the private sphere 
They are in part due to, as I said, some of these shareholder agreements that I think might go too far. They are in part complexities about capital structure and cash flow rights and things like that. Right? But they're not as complex as the equivalent in the non-corporate form, and I don't think they should be. Right? I think there's a choice. Yeah, I, mean, I, I tend to think of it along sort of share and steal lines, right, where you want to have some standardization of uh, terms that allows you to at least know what the essentials are from a tear sheet type of, uh, exactly. yes. <laughs> type of frontispiece, right? Yeah, I think that's exactly right. So I want to start with your first example of an annual meeting uh, and, and ask you, what do you do with Haship, um, in which Chancellor, Chandler, Chancellor Allen, rather, is, is clear that this is a, one of the, he says, one of the few mandatory rules of Delaware. Um, and, and, uh, and then after the case, the legislature amends the statute, and they amend it in a pretty weak way. So, and it's been a while, but Chancellor, but Chancellor Allen's views are still pretty powerful. Um, and and so, the, so the question is, why doesn't that still have purchase? And then the second question, a little bit related, but it goes back to your exchange with Charlie just now in the sense of that complexity is an evil in some setting. If in fact that's so, that's the reason to limit private ordering. Uh, and you, you gave us a lot of should questions. That's an answer. Uh, so why is complexity different? And I would include a few more things that are, that are with that. And, and you, you, you did oversight, transparency, standardization. I mean, uh, I, the corporation itself, um, a limited, the common stock is the greatest example of standardization to create value. Uh, and it, it may possibly limit the liability. So, so I think I'm interested in how far you, will go, you would go in saying that st uh, standardization and its offset complexity is something that can be preferred. Uh, and sorry to throw in the third thing, but in your first example of the list of examples of private ordering, perhaps the one that goes in that list is choosing Delaware versus somewhere else. That's private ordering, and it's an end run to almost everything that you might put in in terms of standardization and complexity. So, so the question is, are there any limits on uh, on uh, being able, do we, do we end up with federal incorporation? So that's three broad questions. Yeah, which I probably can't even remember, but I think your third question actually answers your second. Because, yeah, you can choose to be in Delaware or not, and I flagged a couple of areas in which Delaware law differs from the law of some other states, like until recently, officer exculpation, Revlon duties, right? But Oddly enough, with all this freedom of choice, corporate law in the United States is pretty darn standardized, right? Most of the features that I've been talking about apply across the board, whether you're in Delaware or Nevada or South Dakota, you know, but, the but, features but, of stock, shareholder elections. But your, example, but your elections. example was Delaware doing something different. Uh, could, they, could they in run uh, another state by, I mean, I, I think, you may be right that, that this is the most common, but, but the whole point of private ordering is to let you change for specific situations and do we trust that process or not? Well, but, but what I'm saying is that you've got two things going on simultaneously. You've got differences in what the statutory defaults are, and you may or may not have differences in the extent to which states allow private ordering. And I say may or may not, because most of this contractual theory comes out of Delaware. We don't have a whole lot of cases in other jurisdictions that are talking about freedom of contract. We don't have a whole lot of West Coast unicorns that are not Delaware corporations and in which the uh, legality of these shareholder agreements or the enforceability of these shareholder agreements is being litigated. So it could be 
that what I'm talking about with respect to contractarianism is something distinctive in Delaware or a broader principle of corporate law, and I don't really know. But what I do know is that the essential features of corporate law seem pretty consistent from one state to another, right? And it kind of suggests, it kind of goes back to Charlie's point about standardization, right? It suggests that even though states are willing to compete, right, they're only really willing to compete at the margins, that they too see a value in standardization. And, you know, if you came in with a corporate statute that dramatically changed a lot of the features that we teach in corporate law, you know, that that complexity, that lack of standardization, might be more costly, even if the changes individually were viewed as efficient or desirable for some set of corporations. John? Yes, I've heard maybe one more question. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. go sure. ahead. So I, this was great. Thank you so much. This was like one of the most interesting hours I've had in a long time. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, that's the exam, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, you so, did it. <laughs> uh, so I haven't taught corporate law in about 100 years, so I'm a little bit out of, of my depth on that. I do teach contracts, and I had a couple of questions for you about it or observations about contracts. So I thought I heard you say, well, a shareholder agreement really shouldn't be understood as a traditional contract. Is that a fair? When it's dealing with corporate governance. Characterization, yes. right. I mean, so, I, what I'm doing is I'm kind of separating it out what I think are the personal features of a shareholder agreement from what I think are the governance features, recognizing that that may not be a very precise line. Right, and I, I guess I would just push back and ask, what are courts supposed to do if it's if or to the extent it's not understood in contractual terms? And you don't have to answer the question now, but I was sort of wondering about that. If it's not a contract, what is it? And maybe the answer is it's, it's, it's interpreted and applied and enforced according to corporate governance principles and standards rather than contractual ones. That's, that would be a great answer. Write yes. that down for me. I like exactly. that. Um, number two, um, I think you were talking about um, uh, collectivization and the idea that you know, what we should be thinking about is what's in the interest of the shareholders as a collective rather than on a, sort of inter, a personal, personalized basis. And the question for me that always comes back to, well, who decides and how many you know, if can a, can a rogue minority hoodwink the majority, you know, if the majority just wasn't paying attention on a collectivist theory? And the answer should be yes, right? If they're, you know, whether it's through advanced bylaws or something like that. And, and what then stops that from happening? And I think that's what you're wrestling with. The third thing, and this really is more of an observation, the question is, I, I think the way I think about mandatory versus permissive is a analogous to the distinction between substance and process. And what's so interesting about private ordering in this sphere is that it has, you know, I think, it's increasingly invaded or tried to capture rules about process. And I think that's where at least I get most nervous because if it's all about checks and balances and it's all about sort of, you know, some measures of accountability, then ultimately what we care about is contracting away all of that stuff. So if you go and think about what contract is about, like it is about freedom, but it's also about not giving up all of your freedom. So I can't contract away, I can't contract into slavery, for example. There are certain things that I just can't, and perhaps those are analogous limits, um, even if we, you know, it's, it's what we would, in, I guess, import into our thinking about private ordering in corporate law are thinking about limits to the freedom of contract in contract. Theory and doctrine. So that's it. Yeah, so those are great points. Um, and you have to write them down. Uh, yeah, I'll send you. I'll send you. But in a way, I feel like your third point partially answers your first point, right? Because, right, if it is really a contract, mm -hmm. you're saying, well, okay, but there are these limits even in contract mm -hmm. that we could rely on. Um, I guess, and not being a contract person, but I've always had the suspicion that those are pretty weak limits, and so that kind of pushes me back to your first point, which you know, saying you know that might not be enough. On the sort of minority hoodwinking the majority, I mean that sort of gets back to this distinction between the corporation's interests and the shareholders' interests, right? And you know it, that's a hard point. But some of when I in my second category, when I'm talking about sort of traditional shareholder rights, in part, 
Those shareholder rights are also a check against shareholder majoritarianism, right? And the same way you may or may not like those checks in the democratic process, you might not like them in the corporation. But you think about inspection rights and appraisal rights, right? It's shareholders saying, well, maybe the majority of shareholders reelected this board, but I think there's a problem. Or maybe the majority of the shareholders approved this merger, but I don't think it's a fair price, right? And so if that's part of the corporate structure, right, then we're a little bit worried about, you know, just saying, well, we'll defer to the majority. And, you know, that's... In the Manti case, I think the court, and particularly the majority of the dissent in the Supreme Court, kind of struggle with that as the rationale for appraisal rights. And I think that bakes into this, I flagged public policy, that might be part of your public policy considerations. So I called it early. We have time for one more question. We don't have to take another question. Questions? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I do have a, a follow-up question, which is about the PVC. Um, I'll be talking about this for a minute later. But um, is it does it offend Revlon to convert to a PVC? So you know that's a question that I have worried about, that I have asked, and it's not clear to me what the answer is. And in part, it's because the PVC today is kind of weak, right? I mean, we don't really know whether stakeholder governance in the PBC actually means sacrificing shareholder interests. We've got all of these, I mean, when Viva converted to a PBC, it said, hey, we're gonna convert to a PBC because this is the way of maximizing shareholder value. And I thought to myself, and they said that, it's in the proxy statement. And I said to myself, wait a second, you're converting to this thing that says you don't have to maximize shareholder value as a way to maximize shareholder value. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just not a sophisticated enough practitioner. I don't understand that theory, right? But, you know, so, so, so you know, if you then, if you tell yourself we're maximizing shareholder value, and of course, maybe it's not just for the managers or for the directors who are approving this. It's also for the shareholders who are fiduciaries who are approving this, right? So can BlackRock vote to convert a corporation to a PBC if it acknowledges that that might be sacrificing shareholder value? Arguably, it can't. Or, or, arguably, that's a second order agency problem. And we haven't really confronted it. And we haven't confronted it because a PBC really isn't a big commitment to stakeholder governance and because shareholders retain control. So to the extent that shareholders aren't necessarily happy with what the board's doing, they can still replace the board. Right? You're favoring uh, you know, customers too much. Let's put somebody else in there. You know, but a, a, and this goes back, and I'd ask this question about PBCs as well. If the PBC were stronger, I don't know. I'd be worried. And by the way, again, Think about minority rights, right? You know, conversion to a PBC. What about the minority of shareholders that say, wait a second, right? It's all good for you, but this corporation is in my retirement account, and I don't want to sacrifice economic value because, you know, I want to be able to afford to retire. Charlie, you have one more question? It, this would be narrow, a much narrower question, but I, a hobby horse of mine is the inability to waive liability to stockholders for illegal acts. <laughs> but, uh, and I mean, you were drawing a distinction between rights and duties to third parties, right? Uh, like uh, dividend, uh, dividend rights that uh, implicate creditor rights. Uh, uh, and I think illegal activity is sometimes swept in there as being, well, that's, you know, you're violating duties to other people. But of course, if shareholders waive liability to themselves for the criminal acts, that's not exculpating the directors from facing criminal, li criminal liability from criminal law, right, from, uh, uh, from public law. Uh, is that out of place in 102b7? So cool. Again, you asked a great question. So, yeah, my slides were woefully incomplete because this is also something that is um, super relevant. And it's also super relevant because I was actually teaching Miller against AT&T yesterday. Oh, right. So I was thinking about exactly these questions, right? Um, so, you know, Typically, and certainly at the time 102b7 was adopted, it was our understanding that illegal acts weren't um, protected by the business judgment rule anyway. So the, to the extent that um, 102b7 was kind of like a, a, a business judgment rule on steroids, right, it doesn't mean it had to go that far. 
Miller against AT&T, of course, gives you all of the policy rationales why we don't want directors to have the freedom to engage in this, and we don't want it to be up to, you know, arguably, just is it good for the corporation from an economic perspective. So I think all of that's fair. But the bigger point that I want to make is, you know, I gave you a chunk of 102b7 on the screen. The Delaware exculpation statute is actually quite distinctive. If you look outside of Delaware, other states have very different sort of policy limits on exculpation. And it's not just this issue of directors versus officers. How they deal with things like illegal acts, intentional illegal acts, for example, which are quite different for, from illegal acts, right? Um, knowing violations of the law, violations only of criminal law, right? So there's a lot of room to kind of make those kinds of choices. And if you were thinking about this from the perspective of, okay, private ordering, you know, corporations can or should sort, I can't imagine a corporation sorting itself into a state for the sole purpose of taking advantage of the exculpation <laughs> provision. But, you know, <laughs> but, you know it, it kind of suggests that there's a lot, you know, the, the way Delaware has struck this balance isn't the only way isn't necessarily the right way. And it's led to, um, I think, the development of substantive law in Delaware in some ways that might be inefficient and difficult, like this concept of bad faith. Right? Bad faith in Delaware law is what it is because of 102b7. Now, when I teach bad faith, I have a kind of hard time with it. And if anybody has really good slides or notes on that, I would welcome them. Right? But, you know, it's, you think about, well, gee, if we had a little bit more of a bare bones statute, if we had more freedom of contract here, would that help or hurt? I'm not really sure. But what I am sure of is that, is that the Delaware statute and the way it is isn't the one right answer. Okay, I think we're going to end at that note and to thank Professor Fish for being here and giving such a wonderful <laughs> And we have a 15 minute break, and you can go have co coffee, something to eat, and talk to each other. <laughs> oh, I should be ready.
I'm going to wave. Oh, I'm not visible. Yes, I am. Okay. It doesn't roll well. We're left. How are you? Good. I'll be better later. <laughs> oh, what's later? After, after, after the talk. After the talk. Just relax. Yeah. <laughs> I can just enjoy it. Yes, I'm sure you do. You like to I'm go, sure you all do. You like to go early and then you can, exactly. you can like get out of exactly. your own mind and right. sort of focus out. With a panel, is like each group presenting like one at a time, and then you kind of have like a panel of discussion. That's the plan. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully, uh, Chris Hewitt will join. Oh yes. Uh -huh. I hope so. Oh, let's see. It is 10:30, so we're you know, we run a tight ship here, so we're going to keep uh, keep on schedule here. It's time for the first of our uh, panel presentations uh, of the day. Uh, panel number one, panel number two will be after uh, after lunch. I'm Charlie Corsmo. For those who uh, who don't know me, I'm uh, going to be the. I mean, it's I, I'm on the program as the moderator of this discussion. I don't know that it's really going to require that much uh, moderating, but uh, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I teach uh, corporate law and uh, M&A and occasionally uh, dabble in securities uh, uh, stuff here at Case Western. Uh, this session is going to be a little bit uh, heterogeneous in terms of uh, a topic. You know, in, in one way or another, all of our panelists are talking about the interaction of uh, contract law and private ordering uh, and uh, uh, corporate uh, corporate law, which uh, is a, is a fascinating and capacious topic. So there's uh, there's room for a lot uh, a lot here. Uh, let me just introduce uh, uh, our, our panel very quickly. First, we have uh, participating uh, remotely. So you were I, I apologize to our remote participants. They were not uh, not able to enjoy the dinner last night and the uh, delicious coffee and uh, conversation out in the hall. But thank you very much for. Uh, uh, for joining us uh, uh, remotely, uh, and we're going to have a, a, a paper by Professors uh, uh, Choi uh, Galati and uh, and Robert Scott. Uh, I'll, I'll just give a, a brief introduction. Professor uh, uh, Choi is the Bernard Petrie Professor of Law and the Business Director of the Pollock Center at NYU, uh, the NYU School of Law. Prior to that, he was the uh, uh, Roger Trainer Professor of Law at UC Berkeley, and before that was at uh, the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, he uh, is, in addition to being a, 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 a graduating at the top of his class uh, at uh, Harvard Law School, he's also a, a PhD economist, uh, uh, also from, uh, uh, from Harvard. Uh, professor Gulati uh, is uh, the Pear Bone Professor of Law and John V. Ray Research Professor of Law at the University of Virginia Law School. Uh, and prior to that, he did uh, tours of duty at Duke. Uh, and uh, UCLA and uh, the Georgetown University uh, Law Center as well. Uh, though I have my doubts about this, he claims uh, in his faculty uh, uh, a CV to have won no awards, prizes, or distinctions whatsoever uh, over the course of his uh, uh, serving in all of these posts. I find that uh, not credible. Uh, less difficult to believe, though, is that he, he does list that he won second place at a fancy dress competition as a third grader in uh, in India, so that is not surprising. The the rest of it, I don't believe, though. Uh, professor Scott is the Alfred McCormick Professor Emeritus of Law at Columbia Law School, 
uh, director of the school's uh, uh, Center for Contract and Economic Organization. Uh, in fact, he was a former interim dean at Columbia Law School, and prior to joining uh, uh, Columbia, he was uh, dean of the University of Virginia School of Law uh, as well. Uh, the paper they're going to be presenting is, uh, you can see the slides here, right? Provocatively titled, Are m and Lawyers Really That Much Better? Uh, at what? We'll find out. Uh, and following that is going to be uh, two presentations on aspects of corporate social responsibility and uh, uh, contract design and contract enforceability. Uh, first, uh, uh, Jonathan Lipson will be talking about the ends of corporate social responsibility. Uh, professor Lipson is the Harold E. Cohn Professor of Law at Temple University's Beasley School of Law, uh, has also taught at the University of Wisconsin, the University of Pennsylvania, the University of Baltimore, all over the place. Uh, uh, so we're, uh, we're very happy to have him with us here today. And then last but not least will be our own uh, Professor Julia Kostritsky, who is the Everett D. and Eugenia S. McCurdy Professor of Contract Law. Uh, here at uh, our very own uh, Case Western, uh, also the director of our Center for Business Law. Uh, and uh, she will be presenting her new paper on ESG and private ordering, uh, a new perspective. Uh, and ESG, for the uninitiated, probably most people here know this, right? That stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. Uh, 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 so also a discussion of corporate social responsibility. Uh, so thank you to all of our panelists for being here. Uh, I think uh, the best uh, uh, format here is we're, I'm just going to have all of you present and so save questions uh, for the end. So each of you will have 20 minutes or so to, uh, uh, to present, uh, and that ought to leave us uh, a half hour or so for, uh, uh, for questions and discussion at the end. Uh, and I hope the panelists themselves will, will interact with each other in that, uh, in that discussion, right? Uh, uh, so let's uh, uh, start with uh, Professors uh, Choi, Gulati, and Scott. I, I guess I'll come up here and sort of uh, uh, give you a thumbs up at 15 minutes, you know, when you've gone through 15 minutes and then just start frantically waving at, uh, at 20 minutes for you to, uh, to wrap it up. But uh, I, the floor is yours. John Coates and others. Right? Now, to be fair to John, 
And I, I, it's that he takes, he himself takes a much more nuanced view. But people would often point to, to John Coates's work and say, you know, you're studying this incredibly obscure area, as if to tell us that we were incredibly obscure. We didn't need to be told that. You're studying this incredibly obscure area, and this, these kinds of inefficiencies would not happen in the world of M&A, or especially in the world of private equity. And then they usually say that something like, and when I practiced at Wachtell Lipton or some other fancy firm, this would never have happened. You can see I'm jealous about that. Uh, but the point was that, look, you're, th it varies. Innovation and correction of contract varies across areas. And they would cite a bunch of John's uh, papers that showed that. But let's, let's go on uh, to the next slide. What got us thinking about that, for, for a while we would just be like, fine, your M&A is so special, you are so special, and you know, private equity people rightly should make all the money in the world, and we should just stand, sit in the back corner. But we started reading M&A practitioners, and this is the photo of one of the most eminent of M&A practitioners, Glenn West. He wrote an article, uh, and we were very honored, where he cited to some of our work saying this kind of phenomenon of inefficient adjustment is prevalent all over the m a world and then there was a paper by rob anderson and jeff manns uh, who also seemed to find evidence of this and so this got us a very exciting that was our test that's the subject of this paper so if we could get to the next slide i'll just set it up and then turn it over to steve so we found, thanks to Glenn West and talking to m &A folks in the world of practice, that in uh, the period 2009 to 2013, there, was a, there were a series of articles by eminent practitioners in the most uh, prestigious of practitioner journals, as we understand it, is what they told us. And a lot of this was focused on a particular question, I mean, related to what Jill talked about at the, at the beginning in, in, in her uh, wonderful uh, presentation uh, about being able to uh, contract around uh, fraud liability. And there are some constraints under Delaware law on this. And lawyers were advising other lawyers, senior lawyers were advising other less senior lawyers, I imagine, that look, if you really want to effectively contract around a fraud liability to the maximum extent possible, you need to say in your governing law clauses that the governing law covers non-contractual matters as well as contractual matters because otherwise, uh, you might get stuck because fraud might be seen as non-contractual. You might get stuck with the contract law of Delaware, which is very contractarian, but then uh, the tort law of Massachusetts, which doesn't allow you to do as much private work. And so this was the big concern. And so they said, revise your contracts, revise your contracts, revise your contracts across a range of uh, practice areas, but particularly in M. I, I think this sets it up. Uh, we basically do a horse race that, that on the next slide uh, between a set of areas, and uh, then we analyze it. But in addition to analyzing whether or not there's innovation in the governing law clauses on this particular factor that I talked about, we also decided to look at useless words. So a bunch of courts and practitioners had been talking about useless words, additional words that are thrown in that don't have any value. We call them encrustations. Uh, Glenn West had this particularly wonderful article where he calls them sea squirts, which is a brainless a, a, a creature in the sea that initially has a brain and then loses its brain, never goes away, which is he, his view of contract drafting. So we looked at the encrustations. In the next slide, we talked about uh, our uh, horse race, and I will turn it over to Steve to show how the horse race uh, manifests itself uh, across a range of practice areas, including our M&A and our own beloved sovereign debt. 
Thanks, me too, and uh, uh, it, it's really great to be able to present uh, today, uh, even, even remotely. So, so let me talk a little bit about our uh, empirical setup. So as me too mentioned, uh, we're focusing in particular on the governing law clause, uh, and, and we're looking at four different areas. We're looking at private equity m &A, where our sense is that uh, attorneys uh, are more uh, tightly bound to uh, the principles here of the private equity firms, so there perhaps is lower agency costs. Uh, and uh, as well, there's, there's a lower, uh, uh, I guess, uh, coordination costs among uh, the various participants here. We compare that against two other areas, and the other extreme would be sovereign bonds, where we have higher agency costs. Uh, lawyers uh, for the sovereign, for example, answer to debt managers, but the debt managers themselves are agents of the citizens of, of, or the, the residents of a particular country. So we call this sort of a double agency cost. The debt managers may not care so much about the long-term interests of the citizens, uh, and in turn, the attorneys therefore may not care so much. Um, so, so the argument here is that uh, we might expect greater innovation, greater attention to detail in the M&A context because agency costs are lower, as well as coordination costs are lower as well. In corporate bonds, we look at both high yield and low yield, are somewhere in between. So given this, this range of uh, our hypothesis about responsiveness, we look at the non-contractual innovation. So as Mitya mentioned, there's a lot of pressure, a lot of uh, discussion from 2003, uh, 2009 through 2013. And we look at, well, are there differences between these different areas with different agency costs in their responsiveness to, to this pressure to change, uh, to add the non-contractual clause? And then we also look at incrustations. To the extent attorneys are uh, diving into these uh, governing law clauses, uh, do we also see uh, uh, sort of these uh, other terms being added? And, and one mechanism by which this may take place could be cut and paste, uh, overly aggressive cut and paste, which both may increase the length of the governing law clause, as well as introduce these sort of uh, unnecessary terms that could act in the long term to provide uh, uh, some, some issues or problems uh, for these clauses. So with that in mind, uh, we have a data set. We, uh, unfortunately, we can only start in 2010 due to uh, limitations on our data source, uh, but our data set runs from 2010 through 2020. And as we just said, we, we sort of looked at what happens in each of these uh, four areas. So here's our, our first uh, just sort of summary. Uh, so if I start in that upper left-hand corner, uh, these, uh, this shows for the uh, group of uh, private equity bonds in our data set. We collect about 25 to 30 per year from 2010 through 2020. Uh, what fraction of them have a non-contractual clause? You can see it starts at 15% in 2010. So at the beginning of our data set time period, there already were some, and particularly for the private equity deals, that had a non-contractual term uh, in the governing law clause. Um, but by 2020, it's 50%. So there is a, a relatively large shift uh, from 2010 through 2020. When you compare that to the other three areas, sovereign, which is at the other end of the scale in terms of higher agency costs, more difficulty in coordination to, uh, to affect change in these, these terms, uh, and then low yield and high yield corporate bonds, uh, with pretty much uh, very little change over time. So, so just looking at this, it does look like private equity is different, and there is a greater responsiveness to the pressure from 2009 through 2013 uh, that corresponds to uh, a growing incidence in these non-contractual terms. Now, we did do a statistical uh, test of this. We do a difference and difference model, where basically we're looking at the difference between private equity and everyone else. So we look at the difference in the period uh, from 2010 through 2012, so there's that initial difference, and then we look at how that difference changes. So that's a difference in difference, the initial difference, and then how much does that difference change uh, from 2013 onward, which we treat as the period after that initial pressure for change. So uh, I won't put up the numbers on this model, but when we do the model, uh, this particular interaction term in the model, so this is private equity, times 2013 onwards. So this is really the difference in difference. Uh, how much did the differential in incidence between private equity and everyone else, how much did that change uh, after all this pressure occurred from 2009 through 2013? Well, we saw as a 23.8 percentage point increase, and this was significant at the 1% uh, confidence level. So, and it meets the eye test. We see there this big shift, and indeed it is uh, statistically significant. 
So we take this as, as evidence that, uh, uh, that there was a change and that the, the change was in particular in the area where we would expect it, where the attorneys are, are have the lowest agency costs and most responsive to the needs of their principal, in this case, the, the private equity firms. Now, just a couple of other things we did. Uh, if you look at the next slide, figure two, uh, one thing we wondered about was the, uh, the complexity of the governing law clause. So, so our thought was that, uh, and, and this is sort of a thought about attorney practice and drafting, uh, that attorneys rarely uh, remove existing language, or perhaps a fear that they may be uh, uh, breaking something in the contract. Uh, instead, uh, if there is something new, typically it will be added just as, as an addition, more words. Um, so, so one of the things we looked at was just the length of the contracts and how that changed uh, across our time period of our study. And again, we sort of see a similar pattern. If you look at the upper left-hand corner, private equity starts with uh, more words than the, all the other uh, categories of the governing law clause. At least this is the governing law clause, just the raw number of words in the governing law clause. So already prior to the start of our study, uh, attorneys seem to have been tinkering with the governing law clause more in the private equity context. And then 2013 onward, you can see it's not a linear pattern. There's some variation here with different kinds of private equity firms uh, so, so across time. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but, but generally, it does go up. And uh, we do the same kind of difference and difference model comparing the private equity uh, uh, deals, the governing law clause length, with the other deals governing the law clause length, and how that difference changed uh, in the 2013 onward period. So, so the difference between these and these, uh, and then again the difference later on uh, between the two groups. And when we do that, uh, we find that there is a 60.6 uh, increase in the number of words, so 60 more words uh, in these clauses. Uh, and this again is significant at the 1% confidence level. So these clauses are growing larger, for the, in particular for the private equity, which again is consistent with attorneys tinkering uh, with this clause. Now I think that the next figure is really what I, I think is sort of the interesting consequence of tinkering. When attorneys go in and they change a clause, perhaps for a good motive, uh, do other things change as well? So other things which are not necessarily related to the underlying reason uh, for the change in the first place. So our change is the addition of the non-contractual term, but we see other things change as well. And as Nitu uh, mentioned, we call these encrustations, these are, or cease words, as Glenn West calls these, uh, these are sort of unnecessary words which are added, which could lead to later litigation issues or, or uncertainties. So we do the same comparison. If you look at the upper left-hand corner, uh, uh, the private equity start with more, perhaps because there was prior tinkering before our data set. And then they go up uh, in, again, the 2013 onward. In particular, 2015, 2020, uh, uh, we see uh, a greater uh, number of encrustations. So in our paper, we identify uh, 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 several of them. Uh, and, and we see there's about three on average, or three, three, 2.5 to three in this period, and much lower for the other, other groups. So we did the same test, difference in difference. Uh, and we find that significant the 5% confidence level, a 0.33 increase in the number of encrustations. Now, just one last test. And this test uh, goes to this one observation about these different slides. In the private equity group, and we're in the difference in difference models, we're comparing private equity against the three other types of deals. Uh, we have a mixture of private equity firms, and indeed across any particular year, the private equity firms could be different firms. So they, if they're all private equity, it's a chart. But uh, in this year, we could have Blackstone, and another year, we could have another private equity firm, a different one. So the, the, the mixture of firms may differ, and that could be uh, 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 adding some noise to our results. So our last test is we did a private equity firm fixed effects model. So to do this, we identify the top 15 private equity firms based on an exogenous ranking. Um, and then we collected all the deals by these top 15 firms. So Blackstone was one of our top 15 firms. And we basically look at Blackstone deals and compare Blackstone deals against Blackstone deals, looking again at the 2013 onward time period. So by looking at Blackstone against Blackstone, we we're controlling for Blackstone specific characteristics in a way which uh, this prior slide, there could be different private equity firms in these different time periods, which we may not be fully controlling for. So this type of model is basically comparing Blackstone 
against itself and see, see what happens over time. Uh, and do we see this shift after 2013? So uh, here I will put up some numbers. Uh, the first model is the presence of the non-contractual clause. The second model is the number of words, that's the complexity of the uh, clause. And the third one is the number of incrustations. And we control for deal amount, and here we have private equity firm fixed effects. And this is really the key results here. The 2000 onward coefficient indicates, was there a shift uh, for the private equity firm against itself? So a Blackstone against itself, was there a shift? And what we find is uh, that there is an increase in the non-contractual clause. Uh, there is an increase in the number of words, 141 more words. And there's an increase in the number of encrustations, 0.526 uh, more encrustations. And the little asterisks next to those numbers indicate each one of those shifts was significant uh, at the 1% level. So, so we do find evidence that the market is responsive, uh, particularly the private equity firms are responsive to pressures to introduce a useful change in the governing law clause, the non-contractual term. Uh, uh, but we also find that this increases the overall length of the clause, which, you know, that that's not, isn't necessarily uh, so bad or good, it just means it's more complex, perhaps. But in that increase, we're seeing also incrustations, which could lead to later legal uh, trouble. Uh, so we're seeing both happen at the, at the same time. And, uh, and this is me too slide, but uh, 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 our M&A attorney is better. And I think it's, it, it's uh, complicated. Yes, uh, yes and no. Maybe me too can add some more, but those are our findings. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, me too. If you did have anything to uh, add at the uh, at the end, we'll we'll save it for Q and A then. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, and uh, now, Professor uh, Lipson. Okay. Let me let me just oh. say something about implications. On Excellent. Just to make sure that I earn my uh, cup of coffee here. Uh, this is Bob Scott talking. Uh, one of the important questions going forward in all of this research. Um, which we've done in a number of areas and are continuing uh, to do uh, in even new papers, is to try to understand uh, what are the major influences that lead to this significant lag uh, uh, in between the time when a theory would tell you uh, a faithful lawyer will affect a change in order to protect the client against a um, untoward uh, interpretation of their contract um, and the time when that change occurs or in some cases as you've seen doesn't occur at all um, and the two convenient or at least plausible explanations uh, for that phenomenon are uh, as Steve said uh, our agency costs on the one hand which suggests that there is just a differential in incentives between the parties who are doing the drafting, mostly lawyers, uh, and the, the uh, principals in this case. Uh, and that the lawyers' incentives might well be, for example, uh, to, do, uh, to make less change because change is costly and I might not be uh, able to bill for all the effort that I put in. And this is consistent with a, language in the literature which suggests that one of the agency problems is slack. It's a failure on the part of the agent to work as hard as the agent uh, would uh, otherwise want to be and the inability of the principal to monitor effectively. So that, that's a very convenient and familiar in the literature uh, trope that tries to explain uh, differences uh, in, in behavior. So that's one. But we've also explored in our prior work and in, in some new work an alternative explanation which may lead to the same result, but it's actually different in an important way. And that is the question of coordination. Maybe these agents are perfectly faithful individually, but they face a collective action problem. And that is that on behalf of their client, if they were to act individually, they might actually expose their client to untoward risk. Uh, this would be true if, in, in any of these cases, the contract is standardized. If, in fact, there is what's known uh, by many uh, 
of the lawyers that we talked to as market. And, and market means what the norms of the particular market believe to be the good uh, standard contract term. Now, in this alternative uh, uh, conception, the faithful attorney faces a coordination problem, and the faithful attorney is unable to act individually without exposing the client to unnecessary risks, but doesn't have the wherewithal because of the size of the market or its heterogeneity uh, to uh, work to effectively uh, coordinate a change that all would agree on, and that, and that that would then successfully uh, solve the problem uh, in a standardized uh, way. And we have found those coordination problems particularly acute in the sovereign bond uh, world that we study in, in, other, in other work, uh, and indeed experienced uh, ourselves uh, how it is that in a heterogeneous, heterogeneous, I can't pronounce the word too early in the morning here, um, way, uh, the, the, the parties are unable to affect coordination. And by, just by way of explanation of that, um, of that phenomenon, a, a useful point of comparison many of you may be familiar with is, uh, uh, is the ISTA market, um, dealing with derivatives, where you have a central hierarchy, what we call in other work a, a spider in the web, in the network, uh, that can coordinate uh, changes effectively. Everything we hear about how the ISTA market works is that, in fact, that coordination is successful, even though it's a very large, um, a very large um, um, market. And so one of the things that we would urge uh, people who are more expert than we are in, uh, in these transactions to think about uh, is ways in which we might be able to successfully separate uh, in an experimental way these two different theories in order to determine which one is more prevalent in one case than, uh, than uh, the other. And that, of course, is for us um, work uh, that we have uh, going forward. So, thank you. Um, can we put the slides up? <clears throat> Great, well, while they're getting the slides um, up, I'm Jonathan Lipson from Temple Law School. Um, and I want to start by thanking Juliet and Charlie and uh, Anant and Patty and the, the students and staff here. Um, it's, it's great to be here um, for a bunch of reasons. It's great to hear what Jill has to say. It's great to hear what Me Too and, and, and Stephen and, and Bob have to say. Um, it'll be great to hear what Juliet and others um, have to say. These folks are like all my heroes. And, and um, for those of you who know me, there are two things that are true about me. The first is that I'm kind of a, a dilettante, I can't really make any choices, so I, I dabble in corporate, I dabble in contract, I dabble in corporate reorganization, and so I know nothing about any of them, um, which doesn't stop me from talking about those things or teaching those things, but it does mean you should take everything I have to say with a grain of salt. Number two, I'm terrible at following directions, and so I gave Juliet a title for a paper, I think maybe even a draft, of a paper called The Ends of Corporate Social Responsibility, but then it changed, and, and so the slides that you see are um, about a paper called Against Corporate Social Responsibility, which is slightly different, slightly snarkier, same basic point. Um, so I obviously, you know, will tell you, you know, kind of what that means and why I'm not really against corporate social responsibility, um, but I am, of course, against empty rhetoric about, you know, pro-social market forces and beliefs in what those things can do, um, and about naivete, I'm against naivete about the work that law can do here. So. Three claims in the paper. The first is that um, I, I think basically there is no law of corporate social responsibility. CSR is a legal nothing. It is merely aspirational, as the you know court said in the Walmart's case, um, a pious wish to uh, that something nice will come out of it. Burley said in 1932, right? It feels good, but it is not law in any meaningful sense. Um, number two. Uh, if you care about pro-social market forces and harnessing law to get them to do something, get them to do ESG sorts of things, you might want to think more about contract. And, and so contract social responsibility is 
a legal maybe. Um, it might be the case that contract terms that do these things are enforceable. It might be the case that they have other extra legal benefits. Um, but number three, both of these things, contract social responsibility and corporate social responsibility, are, I think, significantly limited by a bunch of things, including risks of co-optation and fragmentation. Um, this is all part of a larger project that I've been working on over the past four or five years, focusing on contract social responsibility. Um, there are some papers that have already been written, and this one has been in process for several years. And I started to think about it all when I saw the story in the New York Times about Frances McDormand's Oscar speech in 2018, where she says, I leave you with two words, inclusion writer. And of course, what that meant was she wanted actors in Hollywood to use their market power to induce studios to enhance diversity on the movie set by including, you know, riders to that effect in their, in their, in their, in their, in their uh, uh, contracts with the studios. And I was like, well, that's weird. Like, why would you think contracts should do the work of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964? Obviously, she sort of suggests that, that that is the case. So the more I thought about it, the less it made sense, the less I understood about it. And, and so my motivation, you know, takes so the sort of four pieces to it, I guess. First, it's just understudy. There are seven million papers on corporate social responsibility in law, in finance, in business, in sociology, in anthropology. Everybody has something to say about CSR. There are about six papers on contract social responsibility. Two of them are mine, and those aren't very good. So like, there's a lot more to say here, because I think that the truth is that this is where the rubber will meet the road for many, many, many private actors seeking to affect pro-social change. Number two, um, it's an invitation, I think, to assess or reassess Larger questions about the interaction between the public and the private. As private actors or kind of naively understood private actors gain power, multinational corporations gain power, they're going to take on public duties and public responsibilities, sensibilities that I think will challenge how we think about the interaction of those two phenomena, those two, those two concepts. It's also an invitation to reassess the scope and goals of CSR itself. Um, you know, as I say, I don't think that it's really the law. And number four, it's an invitation to reassess the scope and goals of contract theory and doctrine. Um, you know, one of us, um, one of the folks on the earlier panel um, is the author of a, you know, a great paper, lots of great papers on contracts. Um, Scott and Schwartz in 2003 say, well, look, the contract is, 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 is it's characterized by three features. It's bilateral, it's apolitical, private and apolitical, and it's just about economic gain. Um, you know, it's dyadic, they say. It's law should facilitate the efforts of contracting parties to maximize their joint gains and nothing else. And part of, I think, what we're observing in the use of contract terms to get Frances McDormand the diversity she wants is contract attempting to do something else. So with the time that I have left, I'll just, you know, cover three things. Number one, no law of CSR. Number two, law of KSR might exist. There might be a law of contract social responsibility. And in any case, I think there are extra legal benefits um, to using contract. Um, but there are also reasons for caution, and there are questions that I think we can ask about all this, the most basic of which involve the reality that to the extent we're asking private order to do public work, right, we are then inevitably going to import the public policy fights that we would otherwise see elsewhere. So to put it very simply, like my pro-social goals may not be yours. And whether private ordering mechanisms like contract or corporate law are particularly suited to address those conflicts, I think ends up being an interesting question. So why do I say CSR is a legal nothing? Well, because I think it has been set up in opposition to the problem of shareholder primacy, which I also think, by and large, is not really the law. I mean, I absolutely agree with, with Jill that it's a really interesting thing to think about whether Revlon imposes a duty to maximize profit um, for the benefit of shareholders. Certainly, this is what Friedman taught us, that that is the one and only social responsibility of businesses. Although he later had a kind of, you know, reawakening or whatever. He had a sort of second thoughts about that. But, you know, my, one of my heroes, Lynn Lopucky, has a 2022 paper where he says, well, it is the law of Delaware, right? The you know, law of Delaware requires directors of uh, corporations to maximize the benefit of, um, the, maximize wealth of the corporation for the benefit of shareholders. Um, I'm not entirely sure that's true, right? So, you know, Bob Ree has a paper where he says, it's absolutely true, right? It is Delaware law. The law requires that shareholders, that directors maximize economic value for the benefit of shareholders, full stop. Lynn Stout, of course, we know, you know, said, well, not so sure. There are lots of things going on here. And 
you know, this is obviously a robust debate. It connects in some ways to the, you know, collective versus, uh, you know, individualized framing that, that Jill was talking about earlier. Um, but certainly there's no statute that says this, right? I mean, Joan Hemingway and many others says, look, you know, no statute says it. And the case law, once you leave the world of Revlon, is decidedly, you know, wishy-washy on this. I think the closest you get, um, at least that I've found, is the Craigslist case, right, where, you know, Chancellor Chandler says, um, in the context of a privately held company, you basically like, look, you can't enact defensive measures that might inhibit shareholder maximization just to protect a corporate culture that feels good, you know, for whatever pro-social things you might have in mind. There's nothing about Craigslist corporate culture, he says, that time, you know, or Unical protects because giving away services to attract business is a sales tactic. It's not a corporate culture. And Leo, right, Strine says, yeah, that's right. You know, Newmark, the Craigslist case, it is Hornbook law. Well, maybe in Hornbooks, but it's not actually in the case law, so far as I can tell, outside of the decision by directors to auction off the company. And, you know, realistically, even, you know, any, any defensive mechanism you could come up with, you know, with adequate lawyering, I think probably would survive. So one way to read the Craigslist case is that it's about the lawyers and not about the law. Um, shareholder primacy matters because it's been held as being in opposition to corporate social responsibility. There's a law of primacy that prevents us from realizing the aspirations of corporate social responsibility. And so if you think that's true, then you would think there ought to be a law to fix it. And so that's exactly what legal entrepreneurs like Rick Alexander and, and Bill Clark, who are you know, friends of mine from the ABA, have done. They developed a model benefit corporation statute, and they have shopped it around to the states. Um, the basic intuition, as, as the discussion earlier suggests, is that you, know, you can have a corporation whose charter says, you know, provides for a general public benefit. Um, you know, a material, the corporation will make a material positive impact on society and the environment taken as a whole. And we now you know, are perfectly comfortable with this idea. Um, but of course, when you inspect these statutes, in particular Delaware's, Right, as Jill was suggesting earlier, like there is a lot less here than meets the eye. Right, what are directors of benefit corporations supposed to do in Delaware? Balance and report. Right, that's about it. Well, that's you know, I balance the financial goals against the social goals. Fine. I have no idea what that could possibly mean. I have no idea what a court is supposed to do if somebody's grumpy about how the balancing was performed. Even the reporting, okay, so you're supposed to do the reporting, but as you'll see in a moment, like the sanctions for failing, mm, not really clear what those are. Obviously, the big issue here is the final period transaction, and so you know, we worry about the sale of the benefit corporation to a buyer who might not, in fact, honor the public benefit purpose, defeating the expectations of the shareholders you know, who invested in the social cause, um, sort of the equal and opposite of the conversion of the you know, for-profit to the you know, traditional C corporation to a benefit. Um, but really, there aren't many prohibitions there. Delaware started out super restricted. You needed like 90% of the shareholders to agree to a sale. Now, you know, between 2015 and 2020, amendments in Delaware are like, eh, we don't care. Like any, basically, they can sell to whomever on whatever theory they have. Again, assuming, I guess, that they've done the balancing that they're supposed to do. The Model Act um, is a little more restrictive. You need a shareholder, two-thirds shareholder vote to sell it by way of merger, um, you know, to you know, any, anybody else to, I guess, help protect the public benefit purpose. But of course, you could still do an asset sale, if, you know, f get 51% of the voter, the shareholders to agree to that. So not super, not super restrictive. Um, we're not protecting the public benefit purpose a lot. And of course, even if we thought the law did that, what if the directors just don't do what the law seems to say? Well, there's not much risk, right? You know, d &O liability here has been, I think, minimized to, you know, virtually nothing, right? The directors and officers have a duty to balance, you know, the, the sort of the pecuniary and, and social goals, um, you know, in, in basically an informed and disinterested way, you know, consistent with, you know, that the undertaken by an ordinary person of sound judgment. So, like, unless you're nuts, right, your directors are nuts, then, you know, whatever they do is fine and they're not going to be liable. So, you know, takeaway point is pretty clear. Like, I don't think there's a law of corporate social responsibility. I'm not sure there's a law of shareholder primacy. I think it's great marketing. I think CSR can do lots of wonderful things. I think it's not the law, right? What might be the law? Well, contracts. So I've defined in other papers 
con this idea of contract social responsibility as being one or more written terms in an instrument that purports to be an enforceable contract um, that seeks explicitly to achieve some kind of social, economic, or environmental responsibility goals, ESG goals, I guess, um, that is supplemental to or independent of existing substantive legal or regulatory obligations um, through the performance of the terms. Um, four things that contract can do that corporate law cannot do. Number one, specification. Number two, flow through. Number three, monitoring. Number four, remedy. What do I mean? Specification. So one of the reasons I got, other reasons I got interested in this is that my friends at the ABA have been working on model contract clauses to in fact achieve things like protections for labor in multinational supply chain agreements, to achieve environmental protections in you know, those and other kinds of contracts, um, all through highly articulated, specified schedules that would be appended to supply chain agreements or really any kind of, of contract. And this is an ongoing effort by the ABA. And it's super interesting, but they didn't invent it. Francis McDormand didn't invent it. I'm not sure General Motors invented it, but this is the, the, the provision that, that Chris Johnson, you know, who used to be the GC of North America, came up with back in like the 80s or 90s. He said, you know, neither any, nobody who sells to GM can use slaves or forced labor. If you, if you sell to GM, you have to, you, you are promising that you didn't use and, you know, slaves or, or, or forced labor to, 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 to make a product. Um, HP has environmental terms in its standard supply agreement. The oldest example that I found, the Beatles in 1964, they come to the States, they find that the South is segregated, they don't like this. They come back in 65 and they say to the Gator Bowl, if you want us to perform, you have to agree not to be segregated. So their, their standard form performance agreement says, the Beatles will not be required to perform before a segregated audience. And the Gator Bowl integrated for that concert, which is incredible. Um, so that's specification, right? Corporate law can do none of that, right? CSR is statements of policy affecting the organization. Um, by contrast, contract can flow through, right? Which, this is a slightly complicated idea, but the idea is that if you have, right, in the center of this spider web, if you will, you have the kind of multinational corporation, to the left you have the suppliers. The tier one suppliers will make the promises I just described, no slaves, not you know, dumping in the, you know, in the Cuyahoga, whatever good things you want them to do. But of course you worry that they're gonna subcontract all the dirty stuff to other people further up the chain, right? Because that's the only way they can afford to actually make this stuff. So you force the tier one supplier to get their promisors, their suppliers and sub-suppliers to make the same promise. And so this social responsibility specification flows through the supply chain contract. And these can, I mean, these can, you know, run many, 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 many nodes. It's super complicated stuff. So, right, specification, flow through monitoring, right? How do we know that the supplier, the sub-supplier, whoever, tier seven, you know, folks are doing this? Well, the contracts will provide for monitoring. There's a whole sort of ESG due diligence industry that's arisen, questions about whether it works. Fourth and finally, contracts specify, can specify remedy, right? Corporate law doesn't specify a remedy. Okay, maybe appraisal is a remedy, but like not really one that's going to be helpful in any social responsibility sense. So, you know, one of the things that the kind of newest iteration of the, the ABA terms is focusing on is the idea that we'll have remedies tailored to the social responsibility purpose. So if it turns out that a supplier or sub-supplier was using forced labor or was dumped, whatever bad thing they were doing, right, rather than just having them pay liquidated damages to General Motors or HP, they actually have to remediate, and they'll have a remediation plan developed with the buyer. And if damages are paid, the damages go to remediation, not just to, you know, help GM, which is interesting because there will be reputational costs to GM, you know, as we all learned from the Rana Plaza disaster. Fine, so that's contract, maybe better, maybe more effective than, than corporate law here. But I still think there are limitations. I think there are reasons for caution. We shouldn't be exuberant, too exuberant about any of this stuff. Um, number one, there are empirical limitations, um, right, both in terms of practice in the real world, right, I think Jody Short and some other folks, you know, did a study and they're like, well, actually, the, you know, the, 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 the due diligence ESG industry, they actually don't know much and they can't know much for a bunch of reasons because you're never going to find the guys who are actually making the stuff um, and you're never actually going to find the guys who are dumping. So, don't, like, don't get your hopes up. Um, and this has an effect on, on the project because, like, I'm trying to develop an empirical strategy here, so I'd love some guidance on that. There are also institutional limitations, right? If we think that contract or corporate law should be doing the work of, say, environmental regulators or the EEOC, like, what do we do when it turns out that, like, you know, 
we, we actually care, still care about the political realm, right? We want government and public actors to, to you know, sort of do these things. But there's no single institutional solution, as Commissar would tell us, um, to any of these problems. Um, relatedly is the problem of fragmentation and division, right? So, like, I think what Frances McDormand wants is good. She wants diversity on the movie set. Well, Mel Gibson might have a very different view, right? And he might want to harness his market power to get an exclusion rider. What's to stop him, right? Well, maybe not today's Supreme Court. Like, I don't really know. But these are all politically contested things, is the point. And there's no reason to think that that political contest evaporates just because you're running it through corporation or contract law. Um, number three, I think you have problems of co-optation. So Orly Lavelle talks a lot about how formal law in any setting can you know, really drain you know, radical movements, political movements of, of life. And you know, I think if that's true of formal law you know, in the public setting, it's probably true of formal contracts as well. So we need to be kind of alert. If we actually think this works, we need to be alert to assuming that it actually works. And you know, I think there's reason to you know, think it might, but don't get too excited. Um, and you know, just more con most concretely, like, well, what if General Motors knows that they're slaves in the supply chain, but they don't enforce the, responsible, the socially responsible promise because they need their Chevy Volts and they have to sell their stuff and they just have to turn you know, and look the other way for a little bit. Um, no guarantee they enforce. And then, you know, priority in a downturn, number four. Like, okay, well, in the next two years, we're going to learn, I think, a little bit about how serious people really are. What are you really willing to pay for social responsibility? Because there is no free lunch. So the, you know, kind of conclusion is straightforward. Like, I do think contract is, is there's a lot of work to do here. I think there's a lot of really interesting and important things to understand about the, the role of contract in achieving these aspirations. Um, you know, things like specification monitoring, so on, I think provide evidence that it is probably more plausible than corporate governance law, but none of it's perfect, right? None of it's great, um, or at least none of it's optimal. And so, you know, we can never assume that these are complete solutions. Um, other institutions obviously matter, and 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 so how those in institutions that interact with these institutions, I think, ends up being, you know, one of the really interesting questions. I guess we'll take questions at the end, so I'll hold for now. But thank you all very much. Okay, good morning, everybody. I'm Julia Kostritsky. Um, for those of you who don't know me, but I want to tell you that I'm thrilled to be part of this symposium and to be on a panel with such wonderful scholars as Me Too, Bob, Stephen, and Jonathan. And I also want to announce that I'm presenting for my co authors, Jillian Fox um, and Blake Spiller. So the title of my talk is ESG Fiduciary Law and Private Ordering A New Perspective. And again, environmental social governance for those who are um, not in the know. So there's been a lot of pressure on corporations to take ESG into account. I'm not using my slides. I won't use my slides. Um, you'll thank me for not using my slides. OK. So um, there's a lot of pressure um, on corporations to take ESG into account. But there's a lack of clarity on the meaning of ESG. There's uncertainty about also whether following ESG will help or hurt uh, firms financially. So this paper is going to analyze various styles of ESG provisions under contract and corporate law. And a warning, I'm a contract scholar, not a corporate law scholar. So I want to see if they're enforceable under contract law and would they violate the duty of loyalty under corporate law and would a waiver be permissible or desirable? So some clauses that you find on ESG um, in investor rights agreements or shareholder agreements fall within sort of the traditional um, risk compliance realm. And they seem innocuous, such as the com company shall use commercially reasonable efforts to comply with applicable environmental, social, and governments laws and regulations. So those fit within perhaps traditional risk assessment. But <clears throat> at this stage, um, what if proposals went beyond these types of um, provisions for risk management or legal compliance? Um, and there is some evidence that the shareholder proposals today are pushing for um, a sacrifice in uh, reduction of uh, shareholder value. 
Hart and Singales point to the fact that shareholders seem to be pushing companies to do things that might reduce value. Um, but uh, I'm a little skeptical because um, I'm not sure that we can really ascertain that from these proposals. The same uncertainty about the meaning of ESG and possible trade-offs that would be required um, persists. So um, I'm not sure we know um, whether these shareholder pr proposals uh, are pushing for a reduction in value. Um, so what are some of these uns sources of uncertainty about the meaning of ESG? So does a pursuit of ESG mean that stakeholder values can be pursued at the expense of shareholder value? Um, what are the effects of climate change on firm value? Um, some economists like Robert Pindick suggest that you know, there, there's a lot of uncertainty in the models. Um, there's a lack of clarity on how we're going to manage different classes of investors. And <clears throat> there are um, still uncertain effects on firm value. Um, Elizabeth Pullman, in a recent paper, identifies other uncertainties uh, in the ESG realm, including tension between different prongs of ESG, um, such as between labor and environmental. Um, so I um, started with a proposed contract term that um, would maybe squarely pose some of these issues. Um, what if a proposed contract um, sample clause would permit to managers to pursue various forms of CSR, including ESG, in spite of traditional stockholder wealth maximization and fiduciary duties. Well, what about a contract term like that, wherever it appears in a charter or a shareholder agreement? Would that be proscribed under contract law? So I think some of the contract uh, aspects of these clauses are under-theorized. Um, and so I'm going to look at that. So even if we take as a starting point a deference to contractual freedom based on the corporation as a nexus of contracts, um, I still think there are a lot of issues about enforceability. So um, obviously, as a starting point, contract requires uh, contract law requires consent to the terms. The ambiguity on the term ESG may preclude true consent to any of a broad-based ESG term. Um, so the ambiguity in the ESG term renders consent problematic. How can the shareholder, if it is in a shareholder agreement, know what he's investing in or whether to exit without knowing uh, the meaning of ESG and how managers will pursue ES ESG and at what cost and with what effects on firm value. <coughs> so, um, and if we were pursuing the contract line of analysis, we might also be concerned that a broad term of the kind I described at the beginning is too indefinite to be enforceable. So traditionally, contract law refuses to enforce contract terms that are too indefinite. And here, there are possibly distinct meanings of ESG, either that they're mandated to pursue ESG directors at the, even at the cost of shareholder value, or that directors can pursue ESG only if it advances shareholder value. And there's no trade usage or common practice to resolve the meaning, so a court might refuse um, to enforce a term like that. Um, and then, um, again, with contract analysis, um, would it be illegal and against public policy? Um, and that's a constraint on the enforcement of contracts. So a court might refuse to give effect to the contract provision because it would cause the firm to depart from the permitted objective of shareholder wealth maximization. Um, and it might, uh, the court might also refuse to enforce a provision that might be construed as a broad uh, fiduciary waiver. So contract interpretation of these clauses. Um, should that, that would be a, another issue that might come up. Um, a court would have to confront whether a contract provisi provision should be interpreted to permit the sacrifice of shareholder value. How would a court choose between an instrumental versus a pluralistic interpretation, as Bev Chuck and uh, Talarita refer to in their illusory promise uh, article? It would be hard to know. Um, and 
The uh, organizational imperative to control opportunism and agency costs um, might be one factor that would help us in contract interpretation. Under that imperative, courts should prefer an interpretation of ESG that would curb managerial opportunism, and that would suggest no broad clauses for the pursuit of ESG. Um, there might be another contract issue, and that is the need to avoid any conflict with statutes. Um, so if ESG is interpreted as a mandate to pursue, ESG is an independent value that could trump shareholder value, that might run afoul of Delaware corporate law or Delaware statutes. Um, so, um, and w in those situations, when confronted with a contract provision, courts would strive to interpret the provision to avoid a conflict. Now, even though I'm not a corporate law scholar, I wanted to delve into um, the analysis of a broad provision for ESG under a corporate analysis. So, um, and we learned so much from um, Jill Fish's talk this morning. Um, not surprisingly, did we learn a lot. So, um, although corporate analysis um, talks about the nexus of contracts, Jensen and Meckling, the contracts in corporate law are different. They involve trust. Within our ordinary arm's length transaction in contract law, um, in which you, if one in which you bought services, you would not be talking about lingering performance obligations or conflict of interest provisions. So I think a special um, analysis requ is required of those contract provisions um, within f uh, fiduciary law um, and fiduciary duty law. So under, traditional, uh, under the traditional view, in a non-constituency jurisdiction, the shareholders, um, the stakeholders' interests, I'm sorry, should enter only as an instrumental means of achieving um, shareholder wealth or firm value. And there are you know, sound reasons why, under a law and economic lens, the exclusive beneficiaries of the fiduciary duty uh, should be the shareholders, since, as Jonathan Macy says, sharing assets with non-owners would cause a decline in value for which shareholders should be compensated. So, um, so we're on this path of trying to figure out whether um, a clause of the kind that I talked about, which is a broad <coughs> authorization to pursue ESG, would pose problems for um, the fiduciary duty analysis. And um, it may be that um, <laughs> it may be hard to tell uh, if there is a conflict between um, the pursuit of ESG in a broad clause and fiduciary duty. Um, because the business judgment rule will mean that fiduciaries can often hide their actions from investors, so does it really matter that there's a conflict if it can't be discovered? Some scholars say, like it, such as Jonathan um, Povolonis in the Use and Misuse of Fiduciary Duties article, says it doesn't really matter. Um, so if, because... <laughs> um, it doesn't really matter if you identify a breach of fiduciary duty because it's going to be hidden under the business judgment rule. But for reasons that I'm going to come to, I think that it does matter um, to be able to identify whether there is a breach. Okay, so um, uh, um, is a <laughs> what are some of the bad effects um, of mandating the pursuit of ESG? Um, in this broad uh, way in a contract clause. Um, so because the undifferentiated ESG provision would, under one interpretation, mean the director could consider stakeholder value, um, but only for promoted shareholder value, um, and, and the other is the reverse, um, it's hard to tell whether um, this is a violation. But nonetheless, the, the problem is that um, that it poses, that this kind of broad clause, is that sorting by ESG preferences may be impossible or imperfect given the variegated and difficult to communicate preferences and the need to monitor ESG. And um, I think that lack of sorting of um, investors is a significant problem. Um, and it won't be solved by contract law of the type that I talked about, a provision that um, 
gives broad authority to pursue uh, ESG in an undifferentiated sense. So in, in, as part of this um, fiduciary duty analysis, I think that you also have to, um, not only is it hidden, maybe the violation's there, but it's hidden, um, we can't really tell, but um, <clears throat> we also need to think about um, agency costs and ESG. I mean, the final part of any fiduciary analysis um, has to be an assessment of what strategies, private or public, would best achieve the party's goals at the lowest cost, you know, citing Oliver Williamson, among others. Um, so you start with the problems that shareholders face, and that is shirking um, or opportunism by managers, and collectively these are agency costs. So a law, the law supplies a fiduciary duty to constrain that opportunism when parties face insuperable obstacles um, to contract, to controlling these um, costs by contract. Um, so these are not ordinary contracts, but ones um, governed by the fiduciary duty. And the thing that we want to sort of ask ourselves in, ask ourselves when we um, contemplate a contract clause that would authorize the pursuit broadly of ESG is how does the provision of an ambiguous ESG term hinder or help the constraining of opportunism? Um, and the answer to that, I think, um, is going to help us decide whether or not we are going to defer um, to that term or whether we are not going to defer to that type of contract term. So um, <clears throat> there's certainly other means of control of agency costs, and um, Bob Thompson wrote about them in an earlier article of his. Um, and we're familiar with them, um, but um, pricing of shares. Um, uh, the problem is, or other types of um, managerial controls, um, the problem is the ambiguity or the uncertainty about the meaning of ESG um, is going to hinder that pricing. And it's going to hinder other <laughs> um, private control devices to, um, to curb opportunism. So we won't know whether, um, for example, in trying to determine whether or not the managers are doing a good job or not um, <clears throat> in controlling opportunism, um, we won't know whether the manager has the latitude to sacrifice value. So we can't judge how to price the shares. We can't, um, we can't tell whether he's a, the manager is doing a good job or not because we don't know what, his, um, what he's undertaken to do in the pursuit of ESG to the extent that it's vague. Um, if you had um, other, another control like an independent board, then you come back to the same problem about monitoring behavior of managers, it, the monitoring is going to be hampered by um, the lack of content or the ambiguity in the term um, ESG. <clears throat> I think the um, ambiguity in the term will also complicate um, the duty of loyalty, the duty of care, and good faith. How can a fiduciary fulfill his duty of care when there's so much uncertainty about the data on the effects of climate change or ESG on firm performance and firm value? How will the duty of care um, be fulfilled? Can a manager in, be in good faith if he takes an action such as Ford took in committing to the end of gas combustion engines? Is that decision the death knell of Ford? Are the managers in effect sacrificing the entire asset pool even if they won't say so out loud? Um, <clears throat> and even with a low level scrutiny with BJR, um, business judgment rule managers might be liable. Um, <clears throat> is the adoption of an ESG provision similar to a corporate opportunity waiver um, that we should follow? Um, and Gabrielle um, and Rattleberg and Eric Talley have written about this. There are sometimes compelling efficiency advantages from a particular type of waiver, such as for the duty of loyalty for corporate opportunity waivers. Um, <clears throat> although previously the waiver of a corporate opportunity <coughs> ex ante would be regarded as a breach of the duty of loyalty, 
Now, under a new Delaware statute, the waiver would be valid. So, um, and uh, <coughs> Rauterberg and Talley offer um, some efficiency explanations for um, the corporate opportunity waiver. Um, in, in return for giving up the right to pursue selected opportunities for the firm, the firm <coughs> would gain cheaper financing or other benefits, and they make a compelling case for those efficiency advantages. So should we sanction <coughs> the pursuit of ESG in a contract term, recognizing that it might be a violation of the duty of loyalty, potentially, depending on how the term is interpreted, but then say, oh, well, there could be efficiency advantages to allowing it s in a similar vein to um, allowing um, the uh, waiver of the corporate opportunity uh, loyalty duty. But um, should we make an exception? Should we carve out an exception um, here the way Delaware did with the corporate opportunity waiver? Well, n my answer to that is probably no. The uncertainty as to the meaning would burden courts and the uncertainty would act as a drag on gains from trade. It's hard to see how beneficial exchanges could take place given the lack of certainty about the meaning. Um, <clears throat> and it's also hard to see how um, parties could achieve the level of clarity normally required for the waiver of a mandatory duty of loyalty. So, <clears throat> so what are some <laughs> of the um, strategies for uh, solving you know, this problem? So um, either private um, strategies or uh, interventional strategies. So um, one strategy <coughs> suggested by Hart and Zingali is, well, we could just you know, rely on voting. We can leave it up to shareholders. They themselves identify some problems with a voting strategy um, if it's not a yes-no situation. Um, <coughs> And other problems remain with a voting strategy. Scott Hurst points out that managers may need to act before the votes can actually be taken. Um, and can the, <laughs> my question will be, can the uh, board follow the shareholder vote if the, remaining, if, if the meaning remains unclear even to shareholders? Um, a private response to this problem of uh, the ambiguity or the un lack of clarity is, depoliticized uh, investments. So one response to the lack of clarity on ESG um, is, <clears throat> and the extent to which firms are going to sacrifice financial value to promote ESG, is the development of funds that are specifically depoliticized and emphasize that they will only consider factors in their investment strategy uh, that impact uh, financial perform uh, perf that impact financial performance and not other um, considerations. So that's a private, non-interventional response to the lack of clarity um, in the term ESG. It's a form of anti-ESG um, pushback. Um, another, okay, so um, other alternatives. Um, Saul Levmore has a safe harbor. He wants to know, he wants uh, investors to know how the firm trades off shareholder value for ESG causes. Um, so what are some of the other solutions? Some of them, um, and I don't really have an answer to, to the, which of these is best, but I think all of them are, are important in trying to solve the sorting problem. Um, and the ES, <coughs> the, you know, the Federal Securities and Exchange Commission um, in their uh, recent proposal on the naming of funds, you know, goes some way toward um, solving the sorting problem. Um, another um, response would be that we should forbid at the state law level, in some way, contract provisions to mandate the pursuit of ESG without a further definition of meaning. Um, we could require the disclosure of potential adverse effects on shareholder, shareholder value maximization um, and create a safe harbor for doing so. That's Saul Levmore's suggestion. We could require a provision like uh, Professor Fish's that concentrated disclosure by management um, of the effect of ESG on firm performance. Um, I think another thing that we need to do is require disclosure uh, of the uncertainties on the effects of pursuing ESG, require more data on the connection between ESG and firm performance before management can fulfill its duty of care. <coughs> 
Um, and another, <laughs> that my final um, question or that I want to leave you with is, um, I don't think we can really um, look at these ESG clauses solely from a contract or a corporate law perspective. Um, we need to determine if these clauses are the best means of solving firm externalities without introducing other costs. Um, and I want to leave you with those costs. What are the costs of ESG clauses that are undifferentiated and broad? Is it going to increase the cost of ownership? Will it, it by increasing agency costs, by reducing accountability of managers, um, would it prevent companies from going public because of all of these um, burdens? Would it fail to uh, sort investors according to preference, resulting in a heterogeneity of investors? Would, be there, would there be other costs to such clauses? And are these ESG, and here I sort of would differ with Jonathan, um, are these ESG contract clauses or is contract law itself the best way to address firm externalities? And I would sort of conclude, uh, no, not at this time, not with the ambiguity that resides in that term. And I'm going to end there and I'm going to turn it over to um, everyone for questions. Yeah, you should stay up there. I, I was I was not entirely successful with my moderation. We only have 15 minutes now for uh, for questions, but uh, uh, I'll I have some I'd ask, but uh, I'd turn it over to the room and to the panelists themselves. So first, yeah, Professor Lipsum. Um, yeah, thank you, David. I'm sorry. I'm gonna start with um, uh, I think Me Too and his crew. Um, I thought it was a super interesting project. Obviously, I love all of these projects that look at what lawyers are actually doing. Um, in part because I be a lawyer, in part because I do a lot of stuff with the ABA. So the, the first thought um, uh, is really this question, is your model controlling for changes of law firms? Um, and the reason I ask is because you know, one could even imagine that if you know a particular if Blackstone or whomever changes firms, um, the new firm is going to want to show off and show Blackstone that they does it appears to be inefficient, and they're going to have some words to do it. Um, one can imagine all sorts of effects of changing firms. I suspect you do look at it, but if not, that might be useful. Relatedly, practitioner networks. I think Nietzsche and I have talked about this before, but you know, the ABA has an incredibly robust um, M&A group that produces something called deal points, which is something that purports to be market for particular M&A-related terms. I don't know if there are analogous practitioner networks in the world of sovereign debt or low yield or even is them. The whole point of ISA was to keep the lawyers out of the room, right? Uh, so I don't know, you know, if, if, if to what extent that might help explain some of the differences that you see or even how you measure it, but it might be worth thinking about. Um, so those are some questions. Number two, you, I think the claim is that adding words through the incrustation or, or what have you might increase um, litigation risk, uh, increase uncertainty. Of course, that's possible, but it's also possible that at least the lawyers perceive that it will reduce litigation risk or reduce uncertainty. And so I suppose it's possible to study at least the litigation piece of this empirically, although your sample size might be four um, you know, cases. I don't know how, 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 how effective the strategy could be. I mean, then the, the third and final point is I, I love your anecdote, me too, about you know, the students saying, well, this doesn't sound like innovation to me. Like, I read Clay Christensen, and I know what innovation looks like, and this doesn't look like that. I think that's right, and it's more like legal perseveration that I think you're finding you know, the lawyers engaging in, and for perhaps good reason, but it's really hard right, to characterize it as innovative in most cases. So that's it. Thank you. What? There you go. Yeah. So the, the attorney point is a good one. Uh, we do uh, we have the data on the attorneys. We didn't find that the uh, the, the top attorneys were associated with, with the the shifts, um, but uh, but yeah, we, we probably can do a little bit more with the attorneys that into the to, to these tests. Uh, on that attorney networks, um, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure how we would figure out what the networks are. And we sort of looked at which which were the top attorneys. Uh, and see whether they were associated. That, I, I think that's, that's at least as I can see what we can do. If, if there's some exogenous where we can identify these networks, um, I, I think that'd be great, but I'm not quite sure how to do that. But, but I think it's a, it's a great suggestion. 
Um, hi, this we, is an we, You've got a microphone coming here. This is an unbeg. This is great. So I have several questions um, to uh, to you and also um, to our other panelists that are here. I'll start with uh, the Scott, uh, Gulati, and Choi group. Uh, I was wondering, did you look at all at regional advantage? What do I mean by that? You know, in um, there's a lot of literature on the fact that venture capital investments change from region to region. I'm wondering. Do you see any changes with regards to M&A, uh, depending on uh, your geographic locations or not? Two, I will say, uh, again, from my limited experience when I used to practice m and it was funny, I always tell my students, one of my uh, first interviews, they put me in front of a contract, which although I <laughs> studied theory, I had no clue how a contract looked like. And they told me, what would you change here? And the worst thing you could do is take a pen and pencil and tell a lawyer what to change. I started marking the document until a junior associate told me, what are you doing? <laughs> you should say that it's perfect. I'm like, there are archaic provisions here. They said, yeah, but we keep them. We worked really hard on these archaic provisions. So the second question would be, do you even see any contractual innovation? And if so, how is it driven, uh, for example, in, in, again, in venture capital, you have the NVCA, the National Venture Capital Association, and they're really driving the standardization that we're seeing. So I'm wondering if an M&A were now have a similar body that does this. And the second and third questions are to Kostutsky and Lipson. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanted to hear a little more on um, your opinions on whether we can put it in contract or not. First of all, I think it's fascinating, okay? I think there's need for that. I haven't seen much on ESG and contracts, so this is great. Um, so uh, I would love to kind of put you in, in, against each other and, and try to convince us yes or no in that respect. Thank you. Why don't we let our uh, remote panelists respond first? Because we can always spill over into lunch here. So, uh, but uh, we'll. Uh, I'm going to uh, not answer the uh, regional question. That's for Steve. But I am going to uh, talk a little bit about innovation. And I agree with me too. A, a title for this paper had the word innovation. And maybe uh, we will, uh, we're correct in discarding it. Although I told me too, I don't know that I'm wedded to our MA lawyers better than uh, others. Um, but uh, the in interesting question, really, for me, because I, some of you know, do a lot of work on contract innovation, um, is that the setting seems to make uh, a, a huge difference in whether there is innovation or, or not. Um, and one way to think about that is to distinguish between uh, bespoke and standardized sets of transactions. I think the area in which innovation typically occurs and has occurred over time in history uh, is when the transactions uh, initially are, are bespoke. Uh, the classic example today, of course, is uh, collaborative contracting, what I and my co-authors have called contracting for innovation. Um, and you see uh, the classic example today, the one that we're all grateful for is the success of Pfizer and BioNTech, which uh, uh, developed the vaccine by virtue of a collaborative contract that doesn't look like, or 15 years ago, didn't look like a contract at all. Uh, it was radically incomplete. Um, it required um, and depended upon the development of endogenous trust in order to actually uh, develop the substantive terms of the, of the transaction. Those kinds of contracts uh, are, are now ubiquitous in environments of high uncertainty where innovation is necessary. You shift to standardized markets where uh, uncertainty is reduced in large part by virtue of the existence of the market. Uh, the market uh, evens out uncertainty uh, and, and to risk, which is a very valuable uh, service that the market provides. And there, I think innovation is, is uh, discouraged, and as I suggested earlier in my comment, indeed may be even inconsistent with the interests of, uh, of the client. And so thinking about uh, these two poles of contract between bespoke and standardized transaction may help you understand why we see innovation in some areas 
and not in others. Let me just uh, address the regional, uh, uh, and I, I guess I have a question. So, uh, and maybe I missed it. So, regional would that be in the sense of where the private equity firm is located, where the company that's subject to the deal is located? Um, I think we could probably do something with a private equity firm, although I don't know if there's much variation on their location, but perhaps there is. Uh, but we haven't looked at region, but I think it would be interesting to do so. But, but when you say region, uh, what should be our definition of region? That's a great question. So there's a lot of uh, literature on this. Saxanian and others have been writing on the fact that you would find different contracting, whether you're in Silicon Valley, in Boston, in Tel Aviv, basically innovation hubs. And that is something that I spend a lot of time with as well. Also New York, right? Because um, the firms are different. Um, and so you would expect to find different types of uh, contractual provisions and protections for the investors, for the investors. So we focus on the PE firm location. I guess we didn't find much attorney effects, but, but we could look at the attorney firm location as well. Maybe that might be driving something. That yes, would. that's what I would do, because the attorneys are the ones that are picking. And so I think it's the attorneys that are driving this. For example, there's also um, a paper by, um, um, from Harvard, um, I'm blocking Brofman and, um, I'm just blocking on his name now, where they find that it's the attorneys that are driving the choice of the language. So yes, I think where your firm um, is located is going to make a big difference. Okay, thank you. Uh, on the second question uh, uh, to uh, Professor Lips and Kostritsky, uh, just maybe add on, uh, uh, you know, I think I'm persuaded that the sort of undifferentiated ESG term is probably at best meaningless and uh, and um, and maybe harmful in the, uh, in some ways. But is there something more focused, uh, more limited, uh, a more limited ESG term uh, that could be in a corporate charter, or does it need to be in a a supplier contract that uh, the company won't use slave labor rather than in the charter that they won't uh, uh, that they won't uh, contract with suppliers that use child labor or slave labor sort of like body shop right used to have yeah but like body shop used to have a, a charter provision that said we you know we won't engage in animal testing even if it's uh, uh, wealth maximizing sorry cuz i thought that actually john and juliet's presentations kind of pulled together that point. I mean, what John was giving us, I think, is a bunch of very precise ways that you can address the ambiguity that Juliet identified through a contract. And I thought that, that was actually a defense, you know, beyond what you talked about in your presentation of doing this through contract, the fact that you can be that precise. The other piece of that is I think it also provides flexibility. So, you know, I would be worried about those kind of things in a charter because even though we might be able to identify some of them, they might be things that evolve over time in terms even of just relative importance. And being able to do this through contract doesn't lock you in the same way. I mean, you think about, you know, frozen charters and so forth and, you know, the, the worry about doing this within the corporate structure. So um, I think to some degree that answers some of your questions, right? Because you're not, it's not unrestricted choice. Yes, it's not unrestricted choice, but he, how do you get around the, um, and this is kind of what's troubling me, is the sacrifice of firm value. Um, in other words, that is really the hidden issue here, is when you pursue ESG, yes, but at what cost? And that's not really disclosed. You could say, oh, I want to pursue you know, fair labor practices. But what the investor really needs to know is at, at what cost? I mean, what, are, we gonna, are we talking about the sacrifice of firm value to have a, a nice supply chain? Well, but two answers to that. One, implicitly, all corporate contracts do involve those choices and trade-offs, right? And number two, there's a certain limit to our capacity to really know, right? So if we pick 
factory scrubber A versus scrubber B, right? There might be a difference in cost. There might right. be a difference in terms of the environment. Um, it's not clear that we could come up with a clear sort of map of which is best for the corporation in the long term. And by putting it in the contract, we're actually saying, you know, this is a business decision. That, you know, the fact that it affects the environment doesn't change it from any other business decision. But to the extent that the models for looking at the effect on firm value are still, um, you know, sort of preliminary, and there is a debate about whether the pursuit of this or that step will negatively affect firm value. Yes, it can all be hidden um, and all rationalized in terms of long-term value. But people, <laughs> when when there is this idea that you might be, one of the things you might be doing is pursuing stakeholder value at the expense of shareholder value. We should know that. We should somehow know that. But, I mean, the decision to put lights on a baseball stadium, where's Bob? <laughs> right? I mean, is that pursuing shareholder value or is that good for the community? And how do we know at the time we're making the decision? And 25 years later, does that value But maybe what's different is that um, the... Um, there is this incentive to sort of um, market yourself um, this way in order to get, um, you know, investors um, and then to hide what you, you know, sort of, it's a, a little different from, well, you know, the baseball, yeah, um, example, I think, because you, you have an incentive to um, um, either greenwash or hide, um, you know, what your real strategy is in a way um, to get investors and then um, without really telling them, you know, what the sacrifices will be, the cost. But investors aren't locked in, are they? Right? So if you're hiding what you're doing to get investors, okay. investors are the group that's about, like, uh, probably freest to leave. But are they, um, are they going to know? Are they going to know? That there's, you know, that that's the strategy going on. That there's uh, value being sacrificed. Yeah, I think the answer is they may not know until it's too late, right? right that's the right. sort of the Rana Plaza yeah. disaster story that right. I think everybody knows is right. You know, J C Penney learns only after the fact that there's slavery in their supply chain. That they claim they didn't know. Who knows what they knew? But um, it's, a, I mean, these, as I said, like there are four, at least four reasons to be cautious about that, and that is certainly one of them. Um, in in I think response to Juliet's observation about generality versus specificity, I would tend to agree that, you know, that, that a term of the, the sort that you're describing wouldn't be doing much work. And certainly that's not what you see in the real world. Folks are trying to be very specific for all sorts of reasons, some of which have something to do with what looks like law to us, some of which have something to do with business or other things. I mean, contract does a lot of work, only some of which is legal. And I think that's part of what's so interesting about this. Um, you know, whether these terms are enforceable in any meaningful sense is a really hard question because, and this goes to your second point, like, this stuff is hard to cash out. And at the end of the day, like, you know, one of the papers I wrote about this is about specific performance in the setting. Like, what court thinks it's going to order somebody overseas to stop using slaves? Like, the answer is none in the United States. If you think you're going to go register that judgment in that foreign country and get a court there to do it, no, the whole point is the government there probably supports it, right? So it's a real problem. Um, but all that means is that these are real problems and contract can do a little bit of work here maybe, but not a ton. In terms of the, the cashing out question specifically, I mean, it's a great question. I think that's the, at the heart of all this. Like, can we create you know, apples and compare apples instead of apples to oranges, social to economic? And you know, Lopaki's the you know, new paper says, yeah, actually in three years or four years, there's gonna be a standard set of metrics by which we will measure social responsibility. And of course, we'll only have four universal shareholders and so everybody you know, will be living in a sort of Marxist kind of post-revolutionary world where everybody is you know, living their fully enlightened self. Um, I'm not sure I'm quite as persuaded, but you know, I, think, I think there is a view that we are kind of lurching gradually towards concretizing some of these other values that we've thought of as not economic, but in fact they do have economic consequences. And the economic rhetoric doesn't necessarily pick up all the nuance, but I think they're sort of working to get there, is my understanding. But it's slow and hard and messy. Why don't we take one more question and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll break for lunch here. We'll be able to resolve all of this probably better over lunch. Uh, but uh, here, here we go. Uh, 
Thanks. I have a question for uh, Professors Gulati and Choi and Scott. Um, at the end, when you're exploring what are the reasons for differences, I had I was kind of thinking of some other ones and wondered if you had explored these. Um, particularly wondered about the difference in differences between the investors in these products and the kind of expected closeness of relationship they're going to have. You know, sovereigns and corporates are going to have you have a pretty commoditized market and pretty liquid or relatively liquid and investors, you know, there's sort of the question of not just is, is the client um, monitoring it carefully, but how about the investor side? Are they monitoring carefully because they're going to be illiquid or in for a longer time versus just kind of buying through the market? Well, that's an excellent question, and I think it is relevant um, uh, certainly to the agency cost story and maybe even the coordination story. So, for example, uh, in sovereign debt, uh, the investors uh, uh, operate at two different levels. And the first level are when the uh, bonds are issued onto the market, uh, the investor is remote, uh, removed in some sense from the transaction. The underwriter is concerned about placing those bonds at the best possible price in a good market window. Um, the investors who buy the bonds, even if they're fancy um, uh, uh, Harvard uh, University uh, firms and other large-scale investors like that, uh, really have a very little role in uh, influencing the outcome of the contract. That's not true uh, in private equity particularly, where the investors are the powerful entity that probably are in, in, in important. And so, to some extent, I think you're wise to separate the, the, the investors from the agency cost analysis, although I think it, what that does is it, it bleeds into the, the, the question then of, of, of agency cost, because uh, you have more monitoring in, in private equity and very little monitoring um, in, say, sovereign or corporate, or corporate bonds. All right, that brings us uh, brings us to lunch. Please join me uh, again in thanking uh, all of our panelists, and uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and uh, we will reconvene at uh, one fifteen.
escape. Okay. Well, uh, uh, our technical staff back there, are we back on? We are? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. What a, what a great morning. Uh, I am uh, Bob Rapp. I am uh, here at Case Western Reserve. I teach our securities regulation courses as well as business associations and also law theory and practice in financial markets. Now, our second panel today uh, brings three particular perspectives on the role of private ordering. Uh, in, in imposing order uh, on the business of a corporation and in, regulate, in regulating its affairs and the rights of shareholders, or in some cases, those who uh, would be shareholders uh, eventually. And you've already briefly met the three scholars who will uh, uh, present this afternoon. Uh, Professor Robert Thompson joins us from the uh, Georgetown University Law Center, where he's the Peter Weidenbach, Jr. Professor of Business Law, and he will present today on the topic of contracting out in the 21st century. Uh, uh, corporate law, for you know, which he will look very broadly at the uh, ability of parties to change or opt out, uh, of con uh, contract around uh, corporate law rules via private ordering, uh, with a view to developments uh, involving public companies and contrasting approaches in the close corporation and LLC settings, and also considering the circumstances when it is or it should be appropriate to, to do this in all of these settings, and what are the limits of that. Uh, Professor Anat Alan Beck is our colleague here at Case Western Reserve, uh, is a widely recognized scholar on emergent issues and private ordering. Uh, on the, involving the special breed of uh, corporations identified as unicorns, those large private companies about which she has written so extensively and about which she will present today on how bargaining inequality and, and um, uh, equity award information asymmetries uh, have led to some troubling results um, uh, in contracting around and waivers of important statutory rights Professor Gabriel Rutterberg is with us uh, uh, on screen today uh, from the University of Michigan Law School. Uh, he enjoys wide recognition for his scholarship, not only in contract law, but also the empirical study of corporate governance. And he presents today on property contract and process in organizational instruments and the ways we think about contracts in private ordering in organizational governance and the central instruments through which such governance is constructed and the process uh, by which they work all to provide uh, a functional framework uh, in dealing with uh, some tough questions uh, about contracting and private ordering and, and corporate law. And what a privilege it is uh, to have these uh, three scholars who will share their work. And so we're gonna get started straight away with Professor uh, Bob Thompson. We'll continue the format from this morning um, um, and, and provide time at the end of once we have all three uh, presentations for comments and, and questions. So, Bob, the floor is yours. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for staying around. I'm delighted to have a, an audience. Um, can, can we get the slides? My, my, my topic is called Contracting Out in the 21st Century, 21st Century Corporate Law. Uh, the, the goal is to, it, it, it overlaps some of what you've already heard, but, but there's a different take, and so it'll, it'll, perhaps it'll open some reason for a discussion. And, and then what's the, uh, what's the advance button, uh, Jill? How did you? Just enter. Enter, thank you. Um, so, uh, so just to map where I would like to go, uh, as you've already heard, there's been a dramatic shift in, in contracting out uh, in recent years. And I, I just want to emphasize that and illustrate it with a couple of examples. I, I want to look at it in different contexts, in closely held corporations, in VC-backed startups, and in public corporations themselves. Uh, 
the last two benefited from the work of Professor Fish and Professor Ratterberg, who's somewhere on that screen. Um, and we expanded the discussion of contracting out compared to what it was a decade or two ago, and, and that's worth focusing on. Uh, the second point I would make is that all of this, all, all three settings, um, is a distinct change from prior law. Our view of contracting out is not what has been historically in corporate law in the United States. Uh, third basic point is that there are different reasons for contracting out in each of those three categories, plus, plus I think we can add the the contracting, the contract contracting uh, that Jonathan and Juliet talked about, which is, which is actually a, maybe a subset of publicly held. I'm, I haven't decided where it exactly goes, but there are different reasons, and so one size is not going to fit all, and we ought to be de de uh, specifically debating that. And then the, question, the real question is, Jill had a bunch of should questions. Here's, here's, here's an answer. Uh, there, should, the limit, there are limits that should remain. I mean, that, that's, my, that's my perspective. Uh, so, um, and just to go through the first three very quickly, the visible shift and closely held. Um, we haven't mentioned LLCs hardly at all today. They now dominate the closely held space, and they are about contracting out. At, at least, I mean, ELF is one of the first, the, or one of the early Delaware cases. Uh, it's, it says uh, that the, the purpose of LLC law is to give maximum effect to freedom of contract. Now you should know that that was a 19, what, 99 opinion? It was pretty recent, pretty recent policy change because up until check the box, <laughs> it wasn't about contract, it was about tax avoidance. Um, then until check the box, it was, it was mandatory. Uh, but anyway, that's where LLCs are with lots of contracting out. You should also keep in mind, and it's, it's important to me because I've spent some time in my career on closely held corporations, they were at it long before, not long before, they were at it before LLCs. Um, and with the corporate, with contracting out, and particularly uh, 7.32 of the Model Business Corporation Act, which dates till uh, into the to the 90s, and the the uh, official comment to the MBCA, th this is a key uh, sentence. It says it, this contracting out that was in the 90s it validates virtually all types of shareholder agreements that in practice normally concern shareholders and their advisors. It, so contracting out is broad and, and closely held, um, and it's been, it's been around for a while. Uh, secondly, in terms of the visible shift that's happened recently and publicly held, uh, it goes back, just to, just to go through it very briefly, we had mandatory rules until fairly recently, not just from corporate law, but some of it happened from the New York Stock Exchange, but it's part of the reality of publicly held corporations. You, you couldn't depart from one share, one vote. When, when, the, when some of the companies started putting pressure on the stock exchanges, the SEC stepped up with 19C4, and, and the, then the DC Circuit pushed back and said, you can't do that. Uh, this is part of the contracting out in public health, but this is where, the, to me, the modern era starts in this discussion. 102B7, 1985, exculpation for directors, uh, 122, uh, 17, uh, renouncing corporate opportunity is exculpation. It's interesting, um, that's in the charter, and, and, and Jill has written about this, didn't talk about today. It's in, the, it's in the charter or by action of the board. Now that's a weird phrasing uh, to, in terms of contracting out. And, one, and I think we've left contracting out and gotten into something else when we start, let, when we start letting the board do that. And then the, the last point I would raise in terms of things about contracting out in public co corporations in terms of history uh, is that, uh, is that uh, cleansing <laughs> is, is part of the history of contracting out in public corporations. It goes way back to Delaware 144, which says that if, that if you have a conflict, uh, you can cleanse it by actions of the board or by actions of the shareholders, and if you know your history, you know that was, it was not void or voidable solely because it was a limited contracting out. Uh, it has expanded uh, through, the, through case law and, and case law. And so, but as part of the point is, this line has been going on for a while that we've been moving toward contracting out in publicly held corporations for 30 years or more. Um, and it's part of where we end up, which is where I want to get to. Um, to shift to the third category, the visible space in, in venture capital uh, startups, 
Those enterprises are private, uh, but they're not private the way closely held are, which is two or three shareholders. They, they, have, they have a larger number of shareholders, and they don't have the same intimacy in a closely held corporation because they, they are not working at the, at the, uh, at the shop all day. Uh, they, have a, they have an investment, uh, and, and so you, you will get a different kind of contracting out in, in, that, in that setting. Uh, there is some trading of shares in venture capital startups, but it's not the public market. That changes the risk dramatically, and so that changes how far you can go in, in contracting out is, 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 is part of my thesis. Um, there has been greater use of contracting in that space to vary voting, to vary to limit appraisal rights or inspection rights to govern forum selection, all those things show up in this space. And, 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 um, and as, as Gabe has shown in his, one of his papers, a substantial number of new public companies carry forward these different rules uh, into the public space. And, and that underlies part of what Jill has written about in the past as well. So, so the answer is this is a pretty, pretty dramatic change that, that's been going on. Uh, and we ought to do it. We ought to consider it against that context. But I want to contrast it to the history. The history is this is more dramatic than you might than you might think. Um, go back to the beginning of corporate law in the United States before the founding in the early 19th century. Um, we had mandatory corporate law. Why? Because the sovereign decided gave gave a corporation whenever it wanted. Now there was some negotiation. But, but it, it was mandatory law from the sovereign. Um, what's, what I find interesting about early corporate law history is in the early 19th century uh, into the middle 19th century, uh, well, look, go back this way. In, at the time of the founding, all the things that corporations didn't have, they didn't have limited liability. They didn't have centralized control, uh, majority rule. They didn't have immortality. They didn't have lock-ins. All of these things became part of corporate law uh, in the 19th century. And they were done because government was convinced of the benefit of corporations with these extra characteristics and gave these characteristics. And, and, and this is gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come back to this point in a, in a couple of slides, but that's important to how, you under, to how I understand private uh, private ordering. Um, if you look at the post-industrial revolution, the later 19th century, uh, what you see is general incorporation had become the norm. That changes the, the how, how, wh why you might want to contract out. Laissez-faire became the, from New Jersey in the 1890s, uh, and then Delaware after, after Woodrow Wilson went to Washington. Um, that, that, that is part of, of contracting out. Um, the point I would add about history is into the 20th century, there was hostility to contracting out big time in U.S. corporate law. How so? There, there, was, there, was, there was firm law against sterilization, another word for contracting out, uh, uh, of governance, that, that you couldn't change the mandatory basis of the law uh, into the 20th century. Uh, there, there was what was called the fiduciary norm, and, and, if, and if you changed it, you, you, there was no authority to change it. Uh, if you look at what was the 141, which is the key law in Delaware for, and which, in which uh, it, the, 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 pre, the 1927 Delaware law said businesses will be managed by the board. What's significant about that? There were no outs. There was no contracting out permitted. Now you can do it, and even now, you can do it, you can do it in the charter, but, but if you look at 141A, the only way you can amend 141A today is by the charter. Now, Jill has written about how you can do some other things by, by shareholder agreement, and you can do corporate opportunity by the action of the board, but there's still things in the, the 141A, which is letting directors do everything they want, that, that can only be amended through the charter. So, so there's this history of, of resistance, and McQuaid versus Stoneham is the key case that I still teach uh, to, to, um, to, 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 for contracting out. 
Uh, now, I want to talk a minute about those three categories, but talk about the different justifications for it. Um, the uh, wrong button, let's try that one. Um, if you look at the explanation in closely held, what I want to convey to you is why did we let contracting out occur? Because of necessity. What was the necessity? The, the default rules of corporate law were centralized control and the board, majority rule electing the board. Who does that hurt? Anyone that's not a majority. Who is that? It's, any, it's, it's all but one person in the closely held corporation. The, the corporate rules were not workable for most closely held corporations. And that's what moved, motivated contracting out. We had, it was necessity, otherwise it wouldn't work. There would be oppression. Uh, and, and that's the justification for uh, contracting out and closely held. Uh, by the mid 20th century, it was solidly established. It's gotten more established in the late 20th century, but it's different than what you see in publicly held corporations. In publicly held, you have to go find a different justification. Now, I, there's a prelude here, and I, just, I, wanna, I wanna just shift your thought for a moment. Um, the reason for, for all of corporate law was, was how much legislatures and the public felt like that corporations were good for society. And it goes back to the British and Dutch East India Company. They could do things that, non, that other people couldn't do. And, and so contracting out is related to this, to this idea. Um, and, 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 and I want you to keep that in mind as, as we go forward. Uh, how might uh, contracting work in a private setting? I think you have customization as an argument Go back to privately, uh, to closely held for one more moment. If the only people that are involved are at the table, you don't, you don't have externalization. Uh, and that's always, and if, if legitimacy, if, if otherwise you get screwed, you can justify private ordering. Um, you still have the, the insiders know best in a publicly held corporation, but you also have a greater potential of externalization because not everyone's at the table. The other shareholders uh, or the other creditors or, or whatever. Um, in public corporations, I think contracting out is related in part, and this hasn't been talked about today, that internal governance will misfire, that shareholders will not have enough information. They will not have the proper incentives. They, they, will, they will be disruptive of governance. And so we let there be contracting out in part to deal with that misfiring. Um, in, in, that, in that sense, and then you get the externalization further that Jill has already talked about, and these, these terms come in part from her writing, oversight, transparency, standardization are benefits to the collective enterprise that come if you let there be contracting out. So there are different reasons. If you look at contracting out in VC-supported startups, you get a different criteria still. Uh, I'm, I'm using Gabe's example from, from his earlier writing on GoDaddy. What you have there is a founder and two sophisticated investment funds. That's a different relationship that you'll have different, different contracting out. Uh, the usual corporate law rules of centralized control and majority rule are not going to work. There's a little bit of necessity as, there, as well there as well. There's also incentives, but there's also possibly for externalization. And if they go public, then you've got a bigger externalization. So you have to look at the different examples in, in all three. Um, I want to add one more point. I think this debate that hasn't been mentioned today, I think this debate is about, uh, is broader than what we've just done, and it, it, it's, it's contractarianism. And I, you remember that where Jill started her presentation with that picture of that law review from 1988? Um, uh, that's important uh, for explaining why we let there be contracting out. Um, I, I, uh, I'm older than Jill, I was there for that. <laughs> but I just want to share part of it because it, it informs, I mean, I look, I, I just got in tenure, I got tenure at 12, I mean, I, it was a child prodigy, what can I say? Um, it still is vivid in my mind because what it, what it was, was this fight that we're doing, the discussion we're doing today between enabling mandatory and contracting out and Mel Eisenberg was the chief reporter for the, for the previous ALI project uh, he was the author of the, of the main corporations casebook. He was on one side, and the other side was Fred McChesney. 
uh, who was a professor at Emory and was a law and economics person. What's, what was astounding about that conference is, and, the, and, and, and it was mostly an establishment, but Easterberg and Fischel were there and some others, it was the directness of the challenge that contractarianism raised for the first time at that, at that conference. Uh, Fred was uh, brutal in, in taking on uh, uh, McChesney. Uh, he, he called him, I mean, you know, names that would, he, he talked about uh, <laughs> uh, that, he, he, that uh, Eisenberg had stacked the deck in the coercionist's favor. You're a coercionist, Mel. But it was, it was worse than that. It, it became a, uh, I mean, if you think this political dispute in America is bad today, I mean, in that room on that day, corporate law was, was, was that. And what I want to tell you is that that's part of the debate about how far we go in opting out. You have to have that sense. Um, uh, I got longer stories that I'm going to skip for lack of time. Uh, my point is it's about going back to, to Eisenberg and McChesney. It's about corporations. Either you trust corporations or you trust government, and you pick sides between them. Contracting out is affected by not just those incidents of my prior slides. It's affected by your political view of the world, and, and you, you have to take that into account, I think, in deciding what the right answer is. Um, if you put it in those terms, there's lots of reasons for what do you trust government or not. I, 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 got, I haven't got time to tell you about, the, um, about Stephen Field in 1886, but it's a wonderful story. Uh, I, think, uh, I think you can't, Stephen Field thought corporations were the greatest thing for America that's ever happened. That's an exaggeration, but that, that's the direction. That's important to saying, uh, do whatever works for corporations, including let them opt out. He's not worried about the abuse. Um, he, um, and he should, and he, and it, anyway, the story is better than that. I think uh, if you look at, this is an aside, but as, as, if you look at this trust of corporations doing the right thing, it's more pervasive than you ever thought. Poison pills is an example, which you may not think about, but uh, if you think about should there be, uh, could, should you be able to change the rules for tender offers? Well, a tender offer doesn't have the one thing that all the rest of corporate law has, of director veto. In a merger, directors can veto. They can't veto a, a tender offer. So what happens? This is an anomaly that, 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 that Chancellor Allen talked about, that, that how did law get this? And, and, and then Chancellor Chandler said, it's an anomaly that we have this form of takeover that doesn't have directors at the central place of, of corporate law. And, and, it, and, and why do we do that? Well, so we came up with a solution. What was the solution? Private ordering. We trust private ordering so much that we let law firms come up with this Rube Goldberg contraption, which is what a poison pill is, um, that has no explanations. I spent yesterday, two days ago, with my students just blowing their mind. They have no idea how, where it came from, why it works, because it's, we trust private ordering to come up with the answer to the hard questions. So that affects how far we're willing to go. Um, I, uh, I could, do on, I could go on federal securities laws and ESG, but I don't have time for that either. Um, what it's, this is my last big point, but, I, but what I want to argue is that where we are today about what should be the limits, there are limits, even in Delaware law. This is, this is Obiad versus Hogan, which is a chance court decision from six years ago. Um, this is how uh, Vice Chancellor Laster poses the question. Uh, he says, there is a purely contractarian, contract, contractarian view, go back to McChesney and, and Eisenberg, versus a not purely contractual view. And he says, in, in doing that, the primarily part is important, uh, is it primarily a creature of contract? And what he says, I mean, Laster goes back and says, if you have externalization, you can't have a purely contractual view. You have, you have to leave room for mandatory rules. Uh, he actually says the debate over whether it was purely contractual, the, the, the permissive side, it, it was resolved by Section 1104 in 2013, uh, which said you can eliminate, uh, but, not, but within limits. So the point is that even now we have limits. Um, I just want to point out LLCs one more time. The, if you look at what RUPA, RUPA, uh, RUPA says, 
It says an operating agreement may not eliminate fiduciary duty. That's how it starts. And then the statute has except if not manifestly unreasonable. Well, that's opting out, and who knows what it means. There haven't been uh, interpretations of that. Uh, but uh, it does say, and this goes back to Jonathan's point about procedure versus substance, it does say you can identify special categories that are not violations, and you can provide for uh, uh, reasons for cleansing. Uh, RUCLA also says you cannot opt out of oppression. So, so the point is that we do, that we, that we see this, in, but there are limits. Uh, Delaware, there are limits. So this is really a question of, of framing about how much limits can you have. Um, I, I, the last thing I would say is that the, as, as Obed, Obed puts the test, it's always a question of what are the, what are the uh, limits and what, what's the opting out you can do, which is a lot, but there are always limits. And those limits, if you go back and look at footnote two of, of last year, those limits are fiduciary duty. That's what he says. And, and fiduciary duty has always been the limit on opting out, and it's still there even though we have reduced it. Uh, the last thing I would say is if you look at case law, there is a ton of case law in which, in which opting out has happened. Uh, and guess what? The Delaware Chancery Court has to interpret it. Uh, and the Delaware Chancellor, chancellors don't hold back from interpreting it. And these are just four examples. Uh, Adlerstein versus Wertheimer is a corporation with dual class in which you, you, you can't change fiduciary duty. Uh, VGS versus Castile is the same kind of case but an LLC. You can't change fiduciary duty. Fisk versus Partnoy, the LLC adopted corporation governance in an LLC, and that means that you, you are governed by fiduciary duty. Uh, Obed versus Hogan, the case I mentioned before, uh, you adopted a corporate governance, and guess what you get? You get, you get uh, uh, Maldonado uh, Zapata. Uh, I mean, I did not many times you get Zapata, but you get it in an opting out context. The point is, this is a dramatic, big limit on opting out along with the statute and along, along with the traditional fiduciary duty. Uh, the bottom line is, that, that, that we have uh, corporate governance uh, limits. Uh, I went too far, um, so I'm done. Thanks, Bob, that, that, that's just fascinating. Um, the historical perspective especially is, is so interesting, and thank you for doing that. Equally fascinating always is Anat's work and presentations relating to the world, the kind of interesting world of unicorns, and, um, and private ordering is a very significant issue there, as, uh, as you know from her work. Anat, please, yes. we welcome thank you, you so as much. always. This is great. Thank you so much. I'm taking notes throughout this conference. This is amazing. It's my favorite conference so far. Um, and I want to present to you this uh, project that just honestly, today I'm like, okay, I can write five more papers on this topic after everything I just discovered. So uh, I'm going to, <laughs> Julia, your notes. I'm over, over ambitious always. So. Um, um, I want to share with you a little bit of what's going on. What I'll do is I'll present my research question, then I'll set the stage. I'll give you a little bit of an overview of what's going on in the background. And then I'll go back to the central issue. And um, the interesting thing, and, and I've been tweeting about it today as well, because as you know, Elon Musk is going to be really laying off thousands of employees today. And um, reporters are, you know, um, commenting on this. And, and they seem to not realize that there's several um, rules that are going to apply. We have the Warren Act. We have state, federal laws, contract laws. And um, the, the nice thing about this project, it's, large, it's part of a larger 
projects on unicorns. And unicorns are private firms that are worth over a billion dollars. And I like to think about them somewhere in the middle, just like Bob presented, right? They're not like uh, LLCs or other closely held firms. And they're actually closer to quasi-public companies, but they are privately held. And so there's a few more things that are interesting and it affects uh, the bargaining inequality here. And that is one, in, it's very well documented in the finance literature, and that is that they are overvalued, okay? Um, just a second. Yep, it's not working for some reason. Let me try again. Okay. Um, and so first, we have this shift in equity ownership. What do I mean by that? Today, more money is raised in private exempt markets than in our public markets. So we've had this shift um, in our economy, which I think it's very important. And this is really a, a part of, of this shift that I'm going to try to convince you why this phenomena is so important. This is the increasingly uh, crowded unicorn club. So about 12 years ago, if I told you that there's a company that's private, that's VC backed, and it's worth over a billion dollars, you would think that I'm crazy. But today we have, and I monitor them, close to a thousand companies um, that have this uh, status. And some, today it's funny, they're actually trying to avoid that status because I guess it also comes with bad reputation. Um, and this is with regards to the unicorn overvaluation. This is from a model. Uh, there are two professors at Stanford, uh, Strabulaev and Gornel, and they realized that uh, unicorns are overvalued. And not, not only that, they even came up with an app where if you are a startup employee in one of these firms and you want to try to figure out what your company is worth, you can provide information to their app, okay? So they're really, they have an incentive here, right? They want you to provide the information as much as you can. The problem is the lack of information, right? We have an asymmetry of information, even though you're an employee, which means you're an insider, and I'm gonna discuss that in a second. Are you really privy to information? Is it the same as a startup that has three employees, where you're in a startup that can have 10,000 employees, right? You might not have the same kind of information as employees in, and, and closely held startups have. And so, um, so what's happening is that employees in these large firms that are privately held, they don't have access to fair market valuation or to financial statements. And in many cases, not only do they not have access, but they are denied access to such reports even when they ask for them, okay? And, um, and this is a very important development for two reasons, okay? One is remember, they are still private firms, which means they don't have an exit event. Even though we have these secondary markets, most of these firms put restrictions on uh, their employees' ability to trade their stock. And for a good reason, I have to say that, that is something that I documented in one of my first papers, which is Unicorn Stock Option. If I was representing the firms, I wouldn't want employees trading uh, their uh, stock if they exercised it, of course, uh, on these platforms, because then the company is going to be subject to potential violations of securities laws. Okay. Now, let me just uh, explain a few more things, and that is that unicorn employees are usually granted equity in the form of stock options, Okay, which is a right, at, at a promise of equity. They would have to exercise at, to become shareholders in the future. And um, it's a substantial part of their compensation, okay? And um, unfortunately, because we're talking about very large firms, they are in an inferior position um, to other types of employees. For example, senior employees, such as in, in the ones in the management uh, positions or founders or also sophisticated investors, right? Because the others will have information rights and they would usually bargain for them or they would be privy to information that these employees do not have, okay? And what I've been documenting is that um, the firms, these unicorn firms are really um, 
suffering some reputational harm as a result of their practices. I'm going to explain the practices in a, in a second. Their employees are complaining on public platforms like PACE and others that they do not have uh, access to information. There's information asymmetry. They cannot exit. They can't. Um, then uh, they're stuck with the firm. They have these golden handcuffs. Why is this important? How does that relate to our uh, conversation? Um, the interesting part, and it's funny because now I'm talking to a lot of Delaware uh, attorneys, they weren't aware of the fact that also our federal laws are affecting what we're seeing today. And that is, so uh, following the Jobs Act, uh, employees are, um, don't get information that they used to uh, before. So before the Jobs Act, um, they would count employees towards uh, shareholders of record. And the second thing is that they used to get information on valuation and other types of financial information. And to, that was changed in the Jobs Act. So under our federal securities laws, um, these firms are not required to provide uh, employees with information. And uh, what's happening is that if you're an employee, uh, and, and we need to really separate between early hires and late hires, early hires are the ones that are stuck with the firm. They're the ones that have a lot of money on the table, especially, and they um, are not going to compete. And late hires diversify. They, they come in later after the firm already became a unicorn, and they are the ones who are jumping from firm to firm. They, they'll stay for a year, they'll exercise some of their options, and they'll move on to the next firm. And those are the ones that were recently hired, and those are the ones that the firm wants to retain. So this is also very problematic from the firm's perspective. Now, um, this is also very important. I've had uh, conversations with this. People told me, well, why do you want to treat employees as investors? There are employees that work for the firm. Why do they need to make an investment decision? And I tell them because there are several situations where they will need to make an investment decision. For example, if they want to leave, or even if they stay with the firm after 10 years, according to our tax laws, the stock options expire. So they have to make a decision on whether to exercise their stock or not. If they want to leave, the same. They have usually 60 to 90 days where they need to decide whether they're going to exercise their options uh, or just leave them and move to the next firm. And that is a decision. And that decision, if they decide to exercise, is going to have tax consequences. So if they decide to exercise, they will have to pay taxes on profits that never materialize. And it might never materialize. And we're talking about a lot of money. We can be talking about millions of dollars. They have to mortgage their home. They have to take on loans. Okay, and let me give you an example with goods technology, right? Goods technology is always a warning sign. There was a fire sale in the company, and now with down rounds, I think we're going to see more companies going through that, especially now with, with the, the way um, our economy is doing. And in goods, there were employees that exercised their options. Not only did they exercise their options, they went on to secondary markets, and they bought more stock in the company. Nobody told them that the company was going through financial difficulty. There was a fire sale. And the way it works in industry, and I'm very much aware of that, when a company is sold, they take the preferred stock into account. Common usually doesn't get anything. So these people, who ended up paying large amounts of taxes, they end up work, paying to work for this firm because they got nothing after the sale. Okay, These are really sad stories, but they happen, and I have a feeling that today we're going to find more of these stories happening again because of the down rounds. Um, and then I came across Professor Jill's paper on shareholder agreements, and I was fascinated, especially when I read about information rights in the employee context, and immediately I started researching the topic, and I said, okay, this is interesting. Now there's a new contractual innovation. Corporate lawyers figured out that we don't have to provide disclosure to employees anymore, to our securities laws. And so let's think about something. And I read an article from 2006 from the Wall Street Journal that said there's an obscure law in Delaware. 
I love that title, right? You see journalists that never took one of my BA courses, right? There's a section that's called 220 that none of us have ever heard about. They said, well, I know about 220, right? I teach about 220. And so to, what does 220 do, right? If you're a shareholder in a company, it allows you to open up books and records. So anybody who's a corporate lawyer and is familiar with 220 and doesn't have information rights and has a client that wants to know whether they should exercise the rest of their options, what are they going to do? They're going to exercise one or two shares and then make a demand on the company and ask, open up your books and records. I'm a shareholder. I have this right. This is a private company. I want to open up books and records. Domo is actually a, a Utah firm today. It's public. But at the time, it was private. And what did Domo said? No, I'm not opening up the books and records. So of course, there was a lawsuit. This lawsuit, by the way, was in Delaware. And uh, the parties eventually settled. And so I asked, and Delaware was kind enough to send me the transcript because of the settlement, they were not pub they're not public. And I wanted to see how the judges take information rights into account because again, um, let me just say one more, one more thing about t Section 220. Uh, you have a right to open up books and records, but it's under proper purpose. You have to show that you have a proper purpose. And the question is, if you want to know what your value is, right? If you want to be able to value your equity in the firm, is that proper purpose? And the reason the party settled and they didn't want this transcript to be public is they didn't want the judge saying, of course, if you want to value your stock and it's a privately held firm, this is going to be proper purpose. And uh, let me uh, move this forward to a contractual innovation that I found, and I'll show you some statistics of uh, what I found afterwards. But lawyers discovered 220, Wall Street Journal continued to cover the story and corporate lawyers decided to come up with a waiver, okay? A waiver of statutory inspection rights. Let's make employees sign a waiver that until the company goes public, they will not have access to inspection rights, which means they, they are not going to be entitled to open up books and records. And I started seeing memos on this, and I'll even tell you it's even more serious than memos. Um, I even saw the NBCA put it in their formal documents, okay, in their standardized documents. I'm going to explain that in a second. And I was just curious to see how prevalent is this practice. Again, we are talking about private firms. And so what I did is I started looking at companies that had already gone public, tech companies that had gone public, and I was looking for these uh, waivers in these companies to see how many of them adopted them before they, they clean. Because again, after you go public, you cannot have that waiver anymore. So it's only until the period where the company goes public. And I found this uptick since the Domo case. You, you can take a look here where uh, these are numbers of public tech firms that had these statutory waiver provisions in them following the Domo case. Now, let me just say a few more words on why we have this. That is because we have a gap in the literature. Uh, and, and that gap is very clear with the Jewel case. I'm going to get to the Jewel case in a second. And that gap is, we, uh, sec so Section 220 is mandatory. And I'm trying to convince Delaware courts <laughs> and the legislator, please respect the fact that this is a mandatory provision. It has a reason, and, and I document in my paper what is the historical reason for the inspection, right? Again, we're talking about a private company. It's also meant to mitigate against mismanagement. And it's a very important uh, right for uh, shareholders, especially in the context of privately held companies with the uh, asymmetric information that I specified before. And I'm um, there's actually a case now before Delaware, uh, Chancellor um, McCormick is supposed to discuss this, so she wouldn't comment on this when I kept asking her in public, so what do you think about 220? Uh, or you think it's mandatory or can we contract around it? So there's a gap. We have this mandatory section 
but we, which you cannot waive in the bylaws, you cannot waive that in the charter, but we do not know. Delaware has not made a decision on whether you can uh, go around this provision in private ordering in a contract. And where I see that is that I see companies ask their employees to waive it in the stock option agreements that they're signing, sometimes after the fact, which means they just get, I've been interviewing uh, employees just to see how prevalent this practice is. Sometimes they get an email that says, just sign this amendment. They're not even getting the amendment, okay? They, it's, it's, I never did this. When I was in practice and, and we did this, I always sent them the agreements. I always knew they're not represented. Most employees are not represented. They'll just sign anything you give them. But now they're not even getting the agreement. They're just getting this, like a link. Click on this that you just agreed to the fact that your um, equity compensation has been amended, which I think has issues also with contract law. I mean, I think it's pretty awful when you have parties that are not represented. Now, in Juul, there are some uh, other interesting questions. Let me just quickly say what's happening. So this is a California firm. Um, and let me just so, show you a few things. So this is... Um, I mentioned this information in my paper and I'm working on additional papers on this. So Julie's a California firm that's incorporated in Delaware and the lawyers of the employee in Jewel went to California court. Why did they go to California and not to Delaware? Because in California, 220 is absolute. You don't need to show proper purpose, okay? And um, I, that's how I teach 220. I don't know how other people in the room to teach 220, but to me, 220 is not part of the internal affairs. It's an exception to the internal affairs doctrine, which means that if you're in California, uh, if the company is headquartered in California and you are an employee in California, you can ask to open up books and records in California. In Juul, Delaware is saying, no, no, 220 for the first time is part of internal affairs. What it means to me, a California judge doesn't have to respect this. We'll see. I think it's, it might even go up to the Supreme Court. And uh, so in Jewel, Delaware is saying, no, no, 220 is part of our internal affairs, which means you have to respect Delaware law on, on 220. And I checked how prevalent is this case? Do we need to worry about this? And as you, as you know, and I'm showing this, I looked at the unicorn companies, 56% of them are headquartered in California, 89% are incorporated in Delaware, okay? So this is pretty significant. What it means to me, we might have a wave, especially now with the down rounds of litigation on these cases. And in Juul, <sighs> I read the opinion over and over and there are several footnotes. In some of the footnotes, the court is stating um, cases to support the fact that 220 should be mandatory and cannot be waived. In other footnotes, they're saying, oh, maybe you can waive them in private ordering, but they're not reaching a decision on 220, whether you can waive or cannot waive in private ordering. And they said, oh, this is not a topic for this paper. We're only discussing internal affairs. We'll, re we'll get to it later on. So now is later on, and I'm curious to know what's going to happen. Uh, this is just a little bit more of empirical data. Uh, I'm showing the industries, how prevalent it is in, in different industries. And let me just say one more thing um, about this uh, waiver. It was common before in the uh, biotech industry for different reasons was just adopted by corporate um, lawyers in, in this context now of the, uh, of the unicorns, of the tech unicorns, okay? Um, this is a little bit about uh, the language and I have some suggestions for the courts, for the legislator and for practitioners. I think, which I don't know if the legislator is gonna listen to me, they might not because the trend has been actually away from mandatory of respecting mandatory rules, but to allow more private ordering. Uh, what I'm asking the legislator to do is, um, is to take uh, 
stock option holders into account, not just stockholders, and to give them some of the protections in 220 and allow them to access information rights because of this asymmetric information and because of, as I'm showing in other uh, papers, there's a lot of fraud in these companies because um, actually Elizabeth Pullman has a great uh, paper on uh, startup governance where she, so, where she shows that there's a lot of problems in the governance and I'm building on that and showing that many times founders now have dual class in these uh, firms where they get to control the board, they get to control the decisions and they don't represent common anymore. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, our tech staff has uh, uh, Dave Ryderberg up to join us uh, remotely from, as we would say here, that school up north, correct? Welcome, Dave. It's uh, Welcome, Dave. The floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, well, thank you so much to the organizers uh, for having me, and my apologies for not being here in person. Uh, there is uh, the standard amount of baby food on my dress shirt, so that provides the explanation for why it's uh, difficult for me to get out of the house these days with uh, my nine-month-old. Uh, but I'm, I'm so delighted to be here. You know, it's, it's a wonderful conference. Uh, I very much appreciate uh, getting to see Jill's wonderful remarks this morning, and and um, and uh, Chase Western for putting this on. And uh, I'd like to thank especially Bob Thompson for introducing me to the wonderful term coercionist. I'm not sure whether I'm a coercionist, I guess. Uh, I'm going to invite you to help me follow through these things. So the, the, the project, which is really just thoughts, they're, they're, um, they're various thoughts I've had over the last couple of years thinking about um, the, the issues we've teed up. Um, it's called Property Contract and Processing Organizational Instruments. Because the, the main theme of what I'll talk about is that there are two different, quite different, but worthwhile perspectives on the central instruments of organizational governance. And uh, they both have a lot to say to us, uh, but they can often pull in different directions. That makes thinking about the normative issues in designing organizational governance instruments um, uh, extremely complicated. And, and uh, you know, that's, that's just uh, part of the course, I guess. So what are organizational instruments? They're important. They also vary in fundamental ways across organizational forms. So obviously the corporation has the charter, the bylaws, and the shareholder agreement. The partnership has a partnership agreement. The LLC has articles of organization and operating agreement, trust and trust indentures, etc. And uh, recent years have seen important issues arise concerning the limits of private ordering as to these instruments, especially in the context of the corporation. Um, and recent yeah, Delaware case law has pushed this issue to the foreground. It really has been asking the question, are rules of corporate law we took to be mandatory um, actually still mandatory? And so in what sense? So, you know, it's, it's actually kind of more complicated than we thought, because maybe they're mandatory as to the charter. You can't non-consensually alter them through majority of an action, but maybe you can um, consensually alter them, say, through a contract or shareholder agreement. Uh, but one of the things I want to emphasize, and I'll get back to this in a few slides, is it's important to keep in mind that while like, this is the main debate we've been talking about today, and it's an incredibly interesting one, namely the debate about should there be mandatory rules in instruments of governance, there are actually a bunch of other pretty, pretty first order issues that arise in deciding how uh, a legal system should design an instrument of uh, governance. So a little background, you know, um, Two projects in particular took me to uh, finding this issue as important and interesting as I did now. One was um, Eric Talley and I looking into uh, 122.17, which Jill and Bob have already mentioned, uh, in which Delaware authorized corporations to renounce um, corporate opportunities should they so wish. And Eric and I, you know, these slides are much more fun, of course, because they're, they're Eric's slides from our, our project together a while back. Uh, but what we found was that there was, there was a huge uptake amongst public companies, um, hundreds if not well over a thousand public companies that had adopted some form of corporate opportunity waiver. The other project that took me here uh, was studying shareholder agreements, contracts amongst the owners of a firm that can sometimes in the public company context typically do involve the firm itself and that are used to tailor features of firm governance. Now, in, in the shareholder agreement paper 
uh, that, I, that I first did, I really focused on what I took to be the core governance contribution off those uh, agreements, which were contracting over uh, fundamental features of control, over who will nominate uh, individuals to the board, and over whether the company will support those directors, voting agreements in which shareholders contractually commit to vote for another shareholder's uh, designee, and veto rights that are vested directly in a shareholder over corporate action. I continue to think these, these issues are are really of great interest. In some sense, they allow a corporation subject to such an agreement to opt to contractualize politics, right? Insofar as shareholder voting matters, it makes it subject to contract. But what I didn't think much about early, I think, a page or two in that agreement was this issue that's really come to the foreground, which is should you be able to waive mandatory seeming shareholder rights through um, a charter amendment or through a shareholder agreement. Um, just, a, just a few other questions about governance instruments. Um, a different question than should there be mandatory rules. Um, actually, I, just, I, know, I actually added this to the slide. So, so Bob asked, uh, I thought Jill, Jill a, great, a great question um, during, uh, during the opening keynote. And it was, it was in a question, I take it in the shadow of Bernie Black, right? So, so the ghost of the, the great paper is corporate law trivial is still out there. And um, I want to debate as much as the next person, should there be mandatory rules in corporate law? But of course the question is, you know, if we have allowed as much private ordering in the country as we do, you know, 50, 50 jurisdictions in which you can incorporate multiple different entity forms, um, you know, how much hands, uh, you know, Jill noted, oh, there's a lot of standardization. Now, you might wonder if that's an emerging property of an incredible amount of private ordering that we've enabled. So I do think it's a wonderful debate, and I completely agree with, with Jill that in some sense you want to bracket the, the question of, oh, what you could do with your other entity, so we can actually squarely address on the merits the question of should there be mandatory rules in corporate law. But nonetheless, I want to acknowledge that goes to Bernie's paper uh, in the background saying, well, how much does this debate matter? And I think that's, that's always worth keeping in mind. A couple of other motivating questions about um, instruments of governance. Uh, so the some basic questions are, uh, what should the instruments be able to do and why? And these are good questions uh, not only about the corporate charter or shareholder agreement, but about any um, instrument of governance in any organizational form. And uh, as I'll try to discuss, uh, one thing that Joe calls structural integrity has to do with what you might call informational externalities. If we're making governance really complicated, well, then it may be imposing costs on third parties or maybe um, imposing costs on investors as an entire class. And uh, that might mean we really ought to have some serious limits uh, to private ordering here. Um, you know, well, Bob mentioned the Yoshida company, so I tossed in um, some of my favorite images. I've actually spent the last few years in part um, looking at the at private ordering in the, um, the first business corporations in England, the joint stock companies. So here we have the, uh, the corporate charter of the Hudson's Bay Company and a contract from the East India Company. This is really just, I, I didn't have any fun pictures, so I tossed these in, but they're, they're, they're beautiful images of private ordering from 32, 14 years ago. Um, okay, so all right, on to my main topic. Here are two perspectives on government instruments that I think are important and valuable and that we need to take into account in uh, addressing core questions about, um, about how to think about what, what should be permitted in these agreements and how they should be designed. So the first is um, thinking about these instruments as falling on a continuum between property and contract. Property, and by property I mean an instrument that non-consensually alters the rights and duties of non-parties to the agreement. And so I think I take the corporate charter to be property-like in this way. Um, you don't have to have consensus. You don't personally need to agree to the things a corporate charter does for them to alter um, your rights and obligations as a shareholder or creditor in fundamental ways. And I take the shareholder agreement easily to fall into the contract bucket for contractual instruments insofar as um, generally courts have treated the shareholder agreement as only being binding as to the party of that agreement. So that's one perspective on governance instruments uh, that I want to talk about and think is quite valuable. 
And, I'll, uh, and I think it's basically a Hansman Crackman esque. Um, obviously, I, I think uh, Henry and Revere introduced this debate uh, to corporate law, um, at least in, in their classic articles in central rule of organizational law. The second perspective is it's also important to keep in mind uh, not just that governance instruments alter the rights and obligations of um, parties, but also that we should focus on the process through which they are created and changed. So governance instruments not only differ in whose rights they can affect, but they also differ in the process through which they are adopted and changed. So a shareholder agreement differs with the charter not only in its consequences for non-parties, it also differs in, in who can create it and who can change it. Um, and so, um, so let me, let me up. So the, for the property versus contract, it's basically the question, does the instrument bind third parties? Um, some instruments do, others don't. The process, I think you can basically decompose process into two principal elements. Uh, the coalition of actors whose involvement is necessary to adopt or alter an instrument, and the decision rule, the formula that's of actors that coalition must follow to effectively act, say, majority rule or unanimity. To make this slightly less abstract, um, you, can, you can compare process in um, the shareholder agreement and corporate charter, and what's the coalition, what's the set of actors necessary um, for a change to the charter? Um, the corporate board and a vote of all shareholders. Now, uh, Jill noted, really intriguing, so I've never I, I thought about this at all, but it's, so it, it's, uh, I would have written this differently if I thought it. Jill, Jill asked the question this morning, you know, could a corporation in principle uh, decide that it wanted to eliminate through its charter the necessity of a board veto to alter future charter amendments. I, I guess I just, in my DNA, I so assume that the Delaware courts would, be, would not allow that that I've never asked the question. But, but you know, it, depending on where the courts go, that could become a question. Anyways, for the rest of my remarks, I'll be assuming with that proviso caveated um, that the corporate charter can only be created and changed through um, the joint action of a majority of the board and um, a majority of all shareholders. Whose, act or, whose action is necessary to adopt or change a shareholder agreement? Well, only the shareholder parties have that agreement, and the corporation, if it's a party, that agreement. What's the decision rule? Well, the default decision rule for um, adopting or changing the corporate charter is, is a majority vote. So uh, the majority of uh, directors or a majority of shareholders, that's a default. I think it's a, it's a mandatory four, but it's default in the sense that we could uh, later see the majority rule over it. And then for a uh, shareholder agreement, again, the default is unanimity um, amongst the parties. So all the shareholders have to agree, though that too is a default as most things in contract land are. Okay. So, uh, what are some key functional? Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. What are some key functional considerations here? Right. I, I've sketched these two perspective. Um, I'm not there, so I, you know it's hard for me to know whether I've got too slow or too fast. But hopefully, I made sense. That these are both valuable ways to think about governance instruments. They reveal illuminating functional elements of them in different ways. Um, and so, how how should how really can they uh, uh, how can they help guide more of an analysis? Well, um, a couple of examples. So, uh, property versus contract. I think this this should matter to us uh, when we ask a bunch of questions. So, how easy should it be uh, to alter a governance instrument? Well, um, it depends on the costs imposed on third parties. So, um, this is just a, a sort of generous pyramid. Everything else being equal, argument, and, and Jill might disagree, uh, and I really disagree with her with great uh, caution. Um, but. Uh, I think presumptively we should be more willing to allow um, complexity in a shareholder agreement than complexity in a charter because I think there are fewer informational costs. There's less dismantling of structural integrity when you when you add complexity to a corporate corporate governance through a shareholder agreement to a charter because at least insofar as the shareholder agreement is only affecting the parties, that's a big question right? because some, some shareholder agreement things affect third parties, potentially. But insofar as it's only affecting the parties, well, the parties are all subject to the contract. They know exactly what they're signing up for versus the property-like consequences of a charter change, which impose on all of the 
you know, millions of revolving shareholders of a public company, the cost of having to figure out the informational complexity of, of a more opaque um, uh, corporation, corporate governance. Okay, process. I think the key question for the process distinction between the charter and shareholder agreements be when is a board veto appropriate? And um, I think that too is a useful question to ask. Like, uh, the board has an element of it, which is um, it can be an agency cost itself, or, and the board has another phase, which, which it does a bunch of useful things. So it can um, mediate amongst competing constituencies. It can provide advice. It can be an impartial check against an overweening controlling shareholder. So I think there are a bunch of functional considerations that come with both of these perspectives. Okay, um, so let me, let me quickly try to conclude here. Um, some preliminary conclusions. Optimal governance instrument design depends at a minimum on combining both of these considerations. Um, if an instrument binds non-parties, you're gonna wanna think about process differently. Then, and what kind of process you have, whether you wanna include um, a, a partial check like the potential involvement of the board veto. Um, so that's one preliminary conclusion. I think that we really have to combine uh, the, proper, the property contract continuum perspective and the process perspective uh, in thinking about how we design the instruments of governance and what to permit and what not to permit. And uh, the second preliminary conclusion is um, the set of, I, I just mentioned this, the set of persons affected by a governance, a governance instrument affects the efficiency of deviating from the familiar default arrangement. So the informational content of the default charter is undermined by a tailored charter, but it's not as clear to me um, that the informational content of what we associate with the corporate forum is undermined by a shareholder <coughs> agreement. Um, so yeah, so let me end things there and uh, turn it back over. But again, thanks so much for inviting me. I'm super uh, excited to have been involved. I found it immensely uh, interesting to listen to and not, and, and Jill and uh, Bob. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabe, and to uh, each of our presenters this afternoon. Uh, sure, sure. Would you? We have uh, we have time uh, for questions and comments, and uh, uh, the invitation is open. in all of those three great presentations to ask about. But let me try and start off with something very simple because I'm not, I agree that the whole Jewel case is fascinating. And there's also this really complicated procedural history and the race to the courthouse and race judicata and all of that stuff. But let me ask you, um, what if California decided that it should provide shareholders with inspection rights as part of California consumer protection law. So here I'm drawing a little bit on the women on board statute, right? We don't necessarily have to do it through corporate law. And something that I've always wondered is whether the women on board statute really is trumped by the internal affairs doctrine. But you know, California employees who are shareholders presumably are an interest of California from a consumer regulation perspective, right? So would that work? That's a great question. I've been thinking a lot about it, and I think it's even a little more complicated because um, when you're doing business in California, you also have to be a foreign corporation, right? If you have a certain amount. So to me, just by being a for just two things. One, by being a foreign corporation, I think California law applies to you first. Well, and Jewel, Jewel and uh, Jewel, Grove argues that in Jewel, exactly, and Delaware has it recognized the validity of California 1601. Correct. But 1601, even though it's foreign corporation law, it's part of corporation law. It's not about something else. Yes. And so I think in this case, um, I would personally, my view is that California law does apply. And if you don't want it to apply, then be headquartered somewhere else. But I think that here, Delaware is really, um, you know, interfering in, in the, the laws of the state of another state. And uh, with the example you gave, it's even more clear that I do personally, I think that uh, the, that should apply to the company. But that's again, they, they 
Delaware disagrees with that. Well, they might disagree with that example as well. Wouldn't that law arguably fall within the uh, intra-corporate affairs, the sort of middle tier in Shaba Cookie? Well, that's a new, you know, <laughs> I, I, need, I need him to be able to come here and explain the intra-affairs to me first before I can answer that because I'm not sure that I understand what that means. So, or perhaps Delaware can give us a little more clearance on what is that exactly, because I'm not sure what it is. But that's, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for some more clarity on that. Do either one of you see that uh, Jewel changed Delaware's approach to, to um, jurisdictional coverage of corporate affairs. I mean, they've been solid for a long time that California has no place in determining Delaware corporation law. Well, yeah, but that's, again, part of the challenge is California has recognized the validity of forum selection provisions that choose Delaware. So Juul has a forum selection provision. The Delaware court interprets something presumably under internal affairs, right, because it's inspection rights, right? And then the California court says, okay, okay this is race judicata. Exactly. You know, that doesn't seem to really um, get at this tension, right? It doesn't really seem to be properly presented. Yeah, right. and I, think, that, I think we're not there yet, but we're going to get there. We're going to get there, and now it's also conflict of laws issues, right? And I also think that um, it might go up to the Supreme Court because, you know, California can decide what they're deciding. Delaware is deciding clearly something completely different. And corporate lawyers are saying, what do we do? Uh, yeah, so that's, uh, that's really an interesting development. I, I think your consumer affairs question is actually more interesting. Because, but maybe that's because I'm writing off the internal affairs. I mean, California is going to differ from Delaware, mm -hmm. and that's been true since... 1950s, uh, and if anything, Delaware's gotten more adamant in its views, um, and it hasn't made any difference. Um, and then the, for the for the women directors, um, the uh, the precedent, even though it's based upon California constitutional law, it's not it's not so encouraging for California exercising. Right against headquartered companies on it. Well, I don't yeah. really see either well, of those decisions as even. But but it hasn't. That question. No, but no, but hasn't precluding it, but it hasn't decided it. Right. Yes. Yeah. Sure. And an interesting discussion would be on fiduciary duties here, right? And the duty of oversight. And do we are we going to do? Are we going to see the same? I've been pushing Delaware to do what they did with Caremark with regards to that to expand that. So that would be interesting to see if Delaware will follow California and do that or not. So, so, so where does the current Supreme Court come down on California versus Delaware? <laughs> I, I don't know, but it would surprise me. I mean, it would be a, it would be a arresting change if the Supreme Court, US Supreme Court takes a case and has to decide whether or not to enforce Delaware internal affairs law or California laws on, on operating, operating headquarters in California. Um, I don't know how this Supreme Court ha has which, which fight they have, which dog they have in that fight, I guess. Well, I have a question. I'm not sure if it's for Bob or not, or, or Gabe, um, but this is related to something Bob and I were talking about just as we were walking back in. Um, when we're thinking about opting out, um, when you think about provisions that affect governance, could the charter say something like, actually, the, um, the board of directors, directors might give their proxy for voting at the board meeting to either somebody who isn't a director or to like a corporation. I mean, that, there's this literature on whether entities can be directors. Like, can we contract around this sort of fundamental idea that we want um, the board to deliberate and we want the board to be comprised of the, the humans elected by the shareholders? Or can we instead include in the charter provision that says, well, actually, we can contract out for that 
as well. Is that is that a mandatory provision? It's, is board deliberation mandatory? We could we could take a poll of this group. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but even so, yeah. uh, but it's science. But what, they, what, 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 what are what are the mandatory provisions of Delaware law today? How long would it take us to come up with the list? Um, I, what I what I told Jonathan as we were walking in is that. It, it would it would seem to me to be a dramatic shift if Delaware, which is so committed to the power of the board and the power of the board being collective and the power of discussion between board members, if they would say that uh, you could give proxies to a non-board member uh, as if it were a agency proxy right. I, I just um, that would be a a, a conflict with with conception of what Delaware says boards do, but... Except there is the shift in the language of 141A, right? So it's not, you know, it used to be the case that it was the board and only the board. And and now it's broader. It may otherwise be provided in the charter. Well, yes, and there's, I wanted to turn your attention to a nice paper on something similar. Not exactly that, but a good friend of mine, uh, Sergio Alberto, wrote a paper on AI. And right. whether you're, you're familiar with that paper? I that my, my, yeah, my next question about was, well, what if we just give it to the algo? Yeah. Right. So that be a human at all? in the U.S., I think the answer, and I agree with his paper, is no. They're discussing it outside the U.S., and they're making decisions on that in Australia and other places. But I think in the U.S., the answer to that question, I agree with his analysis, is still no. I, I haven't read the analysis, but why is it in the U.S.? Isn't it in Delaware or some specific other state? Um, and, and they might be different, but but uh, what's the theory that says we let machines decide? I mean, we don't have. I mean, so so we so we pass an art. We have an amendment to the articles to the to the certificate of corporation in Delaware that says um, we're gonna we're gonna operate the corporation the way that Bitcoin operates its DAO, uh, and we don't and we don't need people. Uh, machines can do it as well. Um, does the current language of, of 141 uh, let you amend the article to say we're going to be like a machine? And boy, that seems like a reach. Yes, and, and I just wanted to build on that that my interpretation is those are actually partnerships. So they have unlimited liability uh, and um, and that's why a lot of lawyers are now coming up with all these wrappers that they're doing, um, which is also a very interesting development. Yeah. I have, I have questions. Yeah, go yes, ahead. Please, please. Okay. Um, I actually I wanted to follow up uh, on what you guys were just talking about uh, with a question for Bob, which is uh, I, could, I agree with you that as a descriptive matter, um, the role of the board and the fiduciary duty is owed by the board remain, uh, you know, despite the, the nipping flux of Delaware precedents in, in the last 10 years, kind of a hardcore mandatory content. And I'm, uh, I'm sympathetic to virtually all of that remaining the case. Nonetheless, like, uh, as, a, as a wholesale comment, I'm not sure I agree. And, and so, Bob, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if I wanted to ask you, you know, if the year was 1999, and you were, you were being asked whether 11217 should be adopted. Uh, what would your response have been? Just to fill out the question, like, Eric and I, in the paper, I think we have a relatively happy story of how you can alter some pieces of the fiduciary duty of royalty, and it can be good for firms. And we have some empirical evidence that supports that. And in the years since that paper, I, I, I thought that the duty of royalty is actually quite a variegated domain. You know, the terrain includes a bunch of different things. Some of it, it's very hard for me to come up with a plausible efficiency rationale right now for ever allowing people to contract over it. But maybe one or two other things I could think of something. And so, uh, so the question is just sort of like, do you think of the duty of loyalty as being like one, one homogeneous thing and we should not alter it at all? Or do you think there's some parts that might be potentially contractable or, or, or uh, we should allow parties to contract over? But you, we've already done it, right? Yeah, I mean, you no, know, like, you, 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 you,
Uh, there are two questions. I would say in 1989 it was a, it was a mistake. But, but the question is, how much room do we give to make mistakes? Uh, and how much do we say? Because most of what contracting out is, is a balancing question uh, to, to say, what are the relative risks? Um, that what are the relative risks to, to third parties? What is the relative risk to how corporations run uh, if, if, we, if we move this mandatory rule? And, and the risks are going to be different for each decision. Uh, and, and so if you were to ask me, would I say it made sense to ban, to permit opting out of all fiduciary duties? No. Would I do it on a one-off basis? Maybe. And I would make the decision uh, on one-off. Uh, but I would, I think, look, I, I, I teach three things in corporations. And I say, I would even start now in the first day of class. Delaware has three rules. Rule number one, trust directors. Rule number two, shareholders do only a few things, three, vote, sell, and sue, each of them in limited doses. That's the fundamental concept number two of Delaware law. Number three, we rely upon fiduciary duties because we don't trust agency costs that come from the first two. I, I think that, that describes corporate law. And because I think that, because I'm committed to that as, a, as an orient, orienting rule, I would be, to, to remove number three would fundamentally change what Delaware's been for, for all of my life and three lives before that. And that's why I'm having a hard time with the cows and the other developments that we've had. You know, I mean, and, and we'll see what's going to happen next. I mean, it's well, now I mean, with rights as well. I yeah, mean, I are they going to continue? Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, are they going to continue with that with regards to inspection rights? And if inspection rights, which are so fundamental, think about it, in private companies, you can't, you don't even have liquidity. There's really no, um, you know, first of all, I don't think they're uh, insiders the way they call those employees because they're not. When you have 10,000 employees, you're not an insider. You don't know what's going on. You're not management, okay? Um, but second of all, it's such a fundamental duty. Once we start, um, you know, taking that away, what's next? What's really next? Since we've gotten all skeptical about contracting in the public company, Bob, I want to start take you back to where you started your talk, and that's the closed corporation. Yeah. You and I, of course, have a long history with respect to the closed corporation. <laughs> we won't bring everyone in on that history <laughs> here. Or you can if you want. I don't much care. Um, but I wonder, because a lot of your comments focused on sort of opportunities for exploitation, and it seems to me that the closed corporation is sort of the classic opportunity for exploitation. It's an opportunity for exploitation on so many levels, right? Uh, because shareholders don't have an exit right, exactly. because there's huge disparities in terms of bargaining power, because there's these mixed roles, shareholder, but also having an employment position, because of the overlay of family ownership. And it seems like because we allowed freedom of contract early on, we had to make up all of these extra things to protect people that we wouldn't have had to protect if we weren't so happy to accept freedom of contract, like um, you know, shareholder oppression. Uh, yeah, I, I don't end up the same place. Um, uh, <laughs> we certainly had to have freedom of contract because of the uh, the deleterious impact of majority con centralized control and majority rule that we're seeing as crucial to the corporate form, and. And, and so we, we let there be uh, modifications of that, opting out of that, contracting out of that. But rule number three is, but fiduciary duty is for a different reason. It's because of the limits of the human mind. Fiduciary duty is uh, why we don't, we don't mandate. We, look, we now have a lot more uh, uh, prenuptial agreements than we ever had before, but we don't mandate prenuptial agreements. We, 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 we still have divorce court. You, you have to have... Uh, fiduciary duty because of the inadequacies of what people can, of rational, boundary rationality in the context in which you have to trust the other party to be, to be in business with them. And, 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 the, and the optimal answer to that is to keep fiduciary duty. And, and so to me, those two things are not, are not in conflict. Yeah, they're gap fillers. I mean, that's why we have them. But, but you, can't, you can't opt out of them. Uh, if, if you opted out, you'd have more 
you have a lower, you would lower societal benefit from having closely held corporations. That's one thing I, I wanted to go back to, and it was raised in Gabe's um, comments, and that is in this whole discussion about should this rule be mandatory or should this or should we allow um, a freedom of contract alternative? It's got to come back to um, the consequences either for external people or for the costs at the firm. And, you know, Gabe, in your article with Eric Talley, that was central in your discussion about should we, um, you know, how can we rationalize um, an exception to the duty of loyalty with this corporate opportunity waiver? And you weren't, um, in, in discussing um, whether it should be permitted, you came back to whether it would be good and efficient, and you came up with all kinds of rationales for for um, for that. And it seems like that should be you know central for any decision. Like earlier when I was discussing you know this broad clause, um, it's got to come back to is that going to solve the agency costs? And you know, and then if so, and what other costs will it create? And you know, what are the costs for the firm? And so I see that you know when we when we're getting at this issue of uh, the limits on private ordering, it's got to come back to that. Um, you know, what are the consequences for the firm, the costs, and so forth? Because otherwise, it seems like an abstract you know question: should should we allow this waiver or departure? Should we allow this in private ordering? Um, and yeah. I completely agree. Uh, I think there is the only caveat I'd add is there's sort of like there are virtues, and I think there is a necessity to be to approach these at a retail level. Like you know, you have to think about whether some new potential alteration to the mandatory rule um, is is um, whether it has potential virtues or not. Nonetheless, like, I do think Anat and and Jill and others, um, uh, you know, pointed to uh, things that should haunt us whenever we do that retail analysis. Which is whether in aggregate we are undermining the structural value of a, of a numerous clauses like um, corporate form by picking away at it. So, so anyways, it's a, it's a, that's just a way of saying it. I, I completely agree that I think um, you want to say, hey, is there actually a potential efficiency to be gained for firm specific private ordering through this new contractualization mechanism? Nonetheless, you've got to step back at some point and say, okay, are there also things we may not be picking up when we run our event study because it, it's becoming more costly or difficult to think about corporate governance as a whole because the system is being... But that would, be, that would be part of the whole cost-benefit analysis, that you could take you know, Jill's concern and sort of say, well, we're going to weigh that against, well, what are the efficiencies that we have as private worry, but we have to kind of weigh it against... You know the benefits of having corporate form, and yeah, yeah, and I think that's still part of one analysis. <laughs> Dave, I would turn around your question a few minutes ago. Why do you think in 1999 they passed that with in the form they did? Uh, what was suggest? What was different in 1999 from from 1989 or 1979? I, I think the explanation is that uh, there had arisen class of major investors whose business model implicated them in investing in natural competitors, right? Like, 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 you know, there were certainly a lot of VC firms who were, and PE firms who were agitating for the change. And uh, I have mixed feelings, and most of us probably do, about those financial actors that do some good things and do some bad things. But I think their view was, hey, we, we have ownership positions in three different electronic commerce platforms. Yeah. If we don't have one in 2217, we're caught up in intractable fiduciary conflicts. We run into a business opportunity that could be of value to one of these three firms, or us as an investment fiduciary that might want to receive some fourth option. Now, when we don't know what to do, we're facing a serious duty of loyalty question that doesn't have an obvious answer. So, so would, it, would it have made sense to limit that provision to a controlling director, controlling shareholder? Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry, a non-controlling shareholder. Um, yeah. Because once you do the controlling, once you have a controlling shareholder and action by the board, yeah. uh, you got no, you got no check. Exactly, and that's what they're doing. Yeah. 
They're they're picking the winners, and by the way, most cases they are controlling the board. Right. They are telling right. the board what to do. So, so I'm saying, I'm asking Dave whether it made any sense to have to have it outs, out, outside of a non-controlling uh, situation. So uh, I think here's like a, a vague doctrinal answer uh, that I think they would push. They'd say, look, there's the prospect of aiding and abetting liability for the firm if a director has a fiduciary conflict. So you can have a minority VC position. You can own 8% of the company, uh, or 12 or 20%, 20% obviously pushing towards controlling territory. But if you own 15% of the company, and you've placed a principal of your VC firm as a director on the company's board, and they are subject to the standard duty of loyalty, I think the VC firm would say, hey, uh, we want to be able to cover our bases and say, we are able to direct that individual to not share the opportunity without facing the idea that we've abetted a violation of the fiduciary breach. So that's, that's one caveat. Um, but other than that caveat, I think that, um, yeah, what do we, I, well, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's complex, but I, but I, I think that, that line of logic is done so. With that, I had the unhappy task of telling you that we've reached uh, the time to close this panel <clears throat> and the happy task to say thank you so much uh, all three of you for wonderful presentations it is time to invite Julia to uh, uh, provide some closing remarks to us and uh, ring down the curtain on what's been a great day I think so okay, what I can say what I can say is this has been a fantastic day um, exploring the limits of private ordering in the corporate context. And we have so many um, papers to read and things to think about um, and papers to write as a result of this conference. And I'm not going to say anything more than that. But it was really wonderful to have people here and to have people remotely and to meet people remotely like I met Gabe remotely today. <laughs> um, anyway, so um, have, have a great um, time exploring all the ideas that were generated today because um, we're going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> okay.